Looks like we have solved the technical issues we've been experiencing for the latest minutes or so, and we'll be ready to welcome our guests for the keynote address, the first keynote address of this afternoon. Are we on? That's okay. Please give me a thumb up if we are online. So for those of you who have been following us this morning, welcome back. For those of you who just join us, welcome to the first EI2 Air and Space Power Conference. I'm Colonel Richard Rowe. I'll be uh, walking you through the panels uh, this afternoon. On schedule, uh, we will have a keynote address from Colonel Professor John Andreas Olsen from the Royal Norwegian Air Force. Colonel Olsen will offer his views on the air power profession through Air Power Foundation, strategic context, as well as air power in cross-domain integration. I am delighted personally to have the opportunity to hear him directly, as I, probably like many of you, I presume, know him through the many books and articles he wrote on air power and which made him one of the world leading reference on the topic. As professor, Colonel Olson lectured worldwide and received several awards for his work. I could name many of them, mostly on air power, of personal arts, the history of warfare, even on Alexander and Napoleon. I choose to underline a recent interview uh, he gave Colonel Noel for our new review called Vortex. It's a must read. It will be soon released on internet. The audience here had the privilege to have the very first issued. So Colonel Olsen, sir, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation. Really looking forward to hearing your insights. The mic is yours. Thank you so much for, um, for that nice introduction, distinguished guests. It is a privilege to get the opportunity to speak to you at this important air and space power conference. I wish I could be in Paris, but I will do my best from a distance here at the Royal Norwegian Embassy in London. Let me get straight to my hypothesis. Western Air Forces all over the world are exceptionally good at speaking about tactics and technology. We are a high-tech profession and masters of aircraft, and de aircraft development and innovation. We are less comfortable talking about concepts and strategy. The majority of those who joined the Air Force did so to get action and overcome physical challenges Few joined the Air Force because they wanted to theorize, to think and conceptualize. As we adapt to new security and defense realities, we must be intellectually agile, sharp and focused. As we embark on an era of fifth generation technology, we must move beyond first, second and third generation doctrine and air power thinking. We must add imagination to knowledge we must add lateral thinking to facts and figures. And all of this requires a proper understanding of air power and the air power profession itself. In order to utilize the conference topic of synchronizing strategic and operational tempos, we need to comprehend the very phenomena that we refer to as aerospace power. We need to better understand what air power can and cannot do. We need to grasp the strengths, limitations, and potential of air power, and we need to do a better job at communicating what we're all about to the politicians, to the public, and to the other services. I would like to propose a model for you that deals with how we should study air power to better understand all aspects of our profession. 
I used the methodology of Professor Michael Howard, who suggested that any military subject needs to be studied in breadth, depth, and context. This model identifies 24 themes that scholars and practitioners must study to attain an in-depth, broad-ranging, and contextual understanding of aviation and its place in modern warfare, international politics, and statecraft. Next slide, please. Can you confirm that the model is, is on the screen? I cannot see the slides from my position. Could you please confirm that the slide is up? And one more. There we go. Following Professor Howard's advice, part one covers broad developments and experiences reflecting the breadth of how to study air power. Moving clockwise, part two and part three detail operational depth while part four expounds on the wider context in which air power must be assessed. The totality, of these, the totality of these 24 themes is the basis for developing the all essential air mindedness. So let me start with part one and its six themes in the upper left corner. Our first order of business must be the anatomy of air power. That is the implications of speed, range, and height. We must explore the essential elements of air power, assessing its relative strengths and unique attributes. These characteristics include deployability, responsiveness, scalability, precise targeting, and the ability to produce strategic effect from the opening moment of an attack. Perhaps most important, air power allows forces to create mass without massing large numbers of men and machines. By capitalizing on the tempo of operations, air power can produce instant physical and psychological effects that are quite different from sequential and cumulative results on the battlefield. Next, the study of air power must appreciate the art of high command and leadership. Throughout most of the history of warfare, soldiers have dominated the higher command of defense forces, and consequently strategic thinking and political advice. Future high-level commanders must be able to overcome entrenched land-centric military thinking to inform the strategic debate with vision and courage. The biggest challenge for a great air power leader, the biggest challenge for an air force chief of staff lies in the contest of ideas, because that contest shapes war-winning strategies, concepts, and future structures. Entering the fourth industrial revolution with its emphasis on autonomous and remotely controlled weapon systems, the contest of ideas assumes an even greater importance. Airmen must assert their leadership in the joint environment proactively rather than passively await invitations to speak. We also need to understand air power theory. While familiarity with the ideas of Dohe, Mitchell and Severski is important, the modern day theories of John Boyd, John Warden and David Abtula are more important still because their concepts for strategic paralysis and effects-based operations take current technology, tempo in decision making, recent experiences and the changing character of war into account. Needless uh, to say, needed are airmen well grounded in all aspects of air warfare, including the theoretical. Only then will they be able to select the concept of air power best suited to the situation at hand. Military professionals must also dedicate focused study to the impact of science and technology. As I said in the opening, we are a high-tech profession. The advent of stealth drones with greater payload, sophistication and, and weapon dispensing capabilities 
indicates that the drone revolution is very real and will be with us for years to come. I would suggest that new technology has its most important impact not when it's first invented or even tested, but when it becomes integrated into operation and produces a strategic effect. That is, when the new technology makes a lasting operational difference. Military studies often underestimate the importance of international law and ethics. Although no specific treaties govern the use of air power, a significant body of rules based on general international humanitarian law constrains the use of air power in armed conflict. Legality and legitimacy are topics that are important to understand, especially in expeditionary warfare, and we must understand the principles of distinction, military necessity, proportionality, and humanity. The politically desirable and technologically possible must never be allowed to trump international law. With robots increasingly becoming part of our West, um, of our Western democracies, law and ethics constitute the first line of defense. While all these disciplines are important, air professionals must know their history. We must review the evolution of air power and its impact on warfare from the First World War to the present to compare and contrast lessons from different campaigns of the last 100 years. It is crucial to examine the air power record within the context of global and transnational experiences. The military mind must identify what succeeded and what failed in the past under different circumstances and translate those expectations into propositions, principles and best practices. With that broad background in place, the student of air power must have a solid grasp of the profession's roles and functions, that is how to deliver air power. This begins with studying air power's four core enduring roles as indicated in part two in the circle in the upper right corner on the slide. The first is control of the air. To secure freedom of action in the air, land and maritime domains without effective interference from air adversary air power. It provides freedom from attack, freedom to attack and freedom to maneuver as you please. Having control of the air does not guarantee success in a joint campaign, but the bottom line throughout the entire history of air power is that control of the air is the one role that is indispensable to all military endeavors. When all, this, when all is said and done, the reason for air forces is control of the air. The second role is strike. The ability to attack with the intention of damaging, neutralizing, or destroying a target that is to coerce or influence actual or potential adver adversaries. Although strike is just one of the roles, it is the one that normally receives most attention because it causes destruction and casualties. It can take many forms from strategic attack to interdiction to close air support. It is very powerful when applied as part of parallel warfare in which several aircraft can strike targets simultaneously across the entire theater with intent of paralyzing and degrading. The demonstrated capability to strike an opponent allows states to apply a range of strategies from diplomatic warning through show of force to the actual use of force. Third is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, what we call ISR, and that is to inform tactical, operational, and strategic understanding. At the most basic level, this involves getting the right information and intelligence to the right people in the right format at the right time. One of the main, adversary, uh, advance, one of the main advances of next generation aircraft is their netted capability to gather accurate data and disseminate it immediately. Through sensor fusion and data analysis capabilities, the pilot in the air and the operators on the ground receive an integrated air picture in real time, 
offering unprecedented situational awareness. Any war begins and ends with intelligence. Yet, as the movie Eye in the Sky demonstrates, even perfect intelligence can raise legal and ethical issues when it comes to the decision to bomb or not to bomb. We must never forget that war is about human lives. Selecting objectives to strike is the essence of strategy, but being able to strike anything does not mean one should strike everything. The fourth role is air mobility, that is to move personnel, equipment or forces using airborne platforms to enable maneuver and sustainment. The 100 year history of air power validates the airlift as a means of crisis response for both humanitarian relief and military presence. The Berlin airlift was the first embodiment of a soft power approach because it achieved great and notable strategic success without the use of overt combat force. Mobility includes air to air refueling tankers, which extend operational reach and endurance. Helicopters are especially well suited to recover equipment and rescue people, including search and rescue under very difficult, unforgiving conditions. These roles cannot be properly understood without connecting them to the broader studies of command and control, the crucial enabler to lead an air campaign, that is to direct assigned forces by following the principles of centralized command and adaptive execution. Command and control represents both the process and the means for exercising authority over our assigned forces. It unites the people, systems and processes involved in making policy, developing capability, acting upon operational decisions and preparing force for operations to achieve national objectives. Then there is logistics, and that should never be an afterthought. Logistics is applying principles and philosophies to support movement and maintenance of forces. Logistics is fundamental. It's a fundamental component to military capability. It's the critical enabler of air power. Logistics enables forces to mount and sustain air power operations over an extended period of time. And the flexibility of air power is only as good as the support it enjoys. As the old saying goes, amateurs discuss strategy, professionals discuss logistics, because nothing can happen without it. So part two on the slide is essentially the bread and butter of mastering air power. Next, moving to the lower right on the screen on the slide, the student of air power needs to comprehend the cross-domain environment to develop an understanding of how to apply air power as opposed to how to deliver it. That is the collaboration, coordination and integration of air power into joint multinational and interagency environments. Joint operations seek to exploit synergies among the land, maritime, air, special operation forces, cyber and space domains. Such operations have the potential to be extremely effective because of the different capabilities offered by the individual services and they complement the strength and compensate for the limitation of each other, creating that powerful synergy. Inter-service cooperation and joint planning require an understanding of other domains as well as mutual trust and ultimately respect. The optimal joint fight is not one in which everyone participant, participates equally, but one in which everyone participates most effectively. Jointness is about accomplishing the mission, not about mathematics or equal share. Compromise is not a good way to go about. The desired effect must be the driving force for the composition of forces. We must have a joint mindset, but it must be for the right reasons. The air power professional must therefore study air land integration and air maritime integration to the fullest. The latter including aircraft, carrier enabled power projection. 
Separate studies must be dedicated to integration with special forces, mainly because this involves activities that are different from integration of air operations with regular land formations. The so-called Afghan model developed in Operation Enduring Freedom demonstrated the emergence of a new strategy, one in which air power in the form of robust ISR and high precision strike coordinated with special and local forces made a decisive difference. This trinity of air power, special forces and local forces proved successful also in Iraq and Afghanistan, given the military objective that they were given. Supplementing exploration of the traditional environment-oriented branches, separate studies must address space and cyber operations, as mentioned previously today. Space-based services provide vital enabling capabilities for all the, dom all the operating domains, and any student of military operation needs to grasp the importance and utility of space as an operational domain in its own right. New technological advances offer new avenues for both kinetic and non-kinetic space operations. Air cyber integration involves the application of cyber capabilities to create joint warfighting effects in both the physical and the virtual battle space. It can involve cyber operations in support of air operations or the other way around, both defensive and offensive. We have seen how cyber attacks can paralyze societies for a considerable period of time, and the repair costs can be quite high. Cyber is a wild card in future wars because it is so difficult to predict its impact and effects, and, it is, and its true potential has yet to unfold. Air professionals must also understand the relationship between air power and interagency actors, such as the Red Cross, or a range of civilian non-governmental organizations. Such integration is important during a campaign, but even more so as operations transition into a post-war phase focused on establishing a legitimate regime along the principles of good governance, which includes nation building and security sector reform. This is important for winning the peace as opposed to winning the war. So having dealt with the operational aspects of air power, the fourth and final aspect that merits careful attention is the wider strategic context. Looking into the last bubble, lower left corner on the slide, we must understand the interaction between air power and politics. Military action can, can be considered successful if and only if it helps to achieve the political goals set by our national leaders. In the words of Professor Michael Clark, warfare is inherently political and the use of air power in any military conflict, in whatever way it is applied, carries more political overtones and sensitivities than most other military instruments. It is precisely because of air power's strength and potential destructiveness that its application also requires political prudence and restraint. Effective air warfare requires a detailed understanding of an adversary's economic and political systems in ways that tactical action on the ground does not. Potentially, every bomb is a political bomb. This is why the distance between the strategic and tactical levels of war is so short when it comes to air operations. Extending that argument, air professionals must understand international relations and game theory especially the art of coercion, deterrence and compellence in the words of Professor Thomas Schelling. This includes an understanding of nuclear weapons and arms control. It also includes an understanding of how diplomacy works, how diplomats can use air power as a muscle during negotiations and ensure that they can influence the situation. It is also important to become familiar with the experiences from recent multinational operations, working with allies and partners has both advantages and challenges. Understanding different political systems, national sensitivities, cultural pride and doctrinal preferences is just as important as technological interoperability. One thing is plug and play te with technology, 
Another thing is plug and play with the intellect and the conceptual side and the like-mindedness that we have in common. Sun Tzu taught us that if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles, but we need to know our friends and allies and what the sensitivities are. It is no less important to understand the fourth estate, the press and the media. The instant reporting puts extra pressure on those involved in air power. Air power produces highly visible results. The physical drama and the psychological trauma always lend themselves to negative and graphic depictions. We must do better to win the battle of the narrative. The truth must never be the first casualty of war. We must always be accountable to our people. That is the essence of a democracy. Air power professionals must also be able to justify the cost of combat air power. Building first-rate air forces is undeniably very expensive. Consider the cost of a fifth-generation aircraft. Both parliamentarians and the public must understand that air power is worth the investment. Otherwise, they will not spend money on defense and air forces. The true cost of military equipment must be measured not by unit cost, but by the effect an asset has on the opponent. That is the all important question of operational cost effectiveness. Viewed in this way, even an expensive weapon can be relatively inexpensive in terms of effect. As far as one liners go, aircraft is an investment, not a cost. A strong air force is an investment in national security. This insight also applies to the interdependent relationship between industry and air power. There is a strong linkage between politics and aerospace industry. Nations tend to cooperate with and buy material from like-minded nations that they trust. On a national level, Partners for Building Aircraft strengthens international cooperation and operational interoperability. To summarize, ladies and gentlemen, this is in many ways a guide to how to study air power. It's intended to improve our understanding of aerospace power by covering a range of interdependent themes and interpretations rather than by advocating one specific approach. The objective is to develop an appreciation of the whole story. In order to synchronize strategic and operational tempo meaningfully, we need a rounded understanding of air power. We need to add conceptual thinking to our technological expertise. The model presented here today should encourage military professionals to combine the insights gained from various perspectives with their specific field of expertise and ultimately incorporate their enhanced air power competence into decisions and discussions with political decision makers, NGOs, and fellow comrades of all services. Final slide, please. Air power is a strategic weapon in ways that surfaces, surface forces are not, because it can operate effectively and simultaneously at all three levels of war from the outset. Although defense may be the strongest form of war on land, this principle does not apply to air power because of its ability to strike quickly, virtually anywhere, and often with little or no warning. When used wisely, air power offers the advantage of operating at the strategic level of war while forcing the enemy to fight at the tactical level. For us to improve our air power profession, we need to link the intellectual domain to the technological domain. We cannot afford to remain intellectually lazy. We have to put an effort into the thinking uh, behind the profession, the thinking of air power strategy and the conceptualization of future warfare. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, sir, for your insights, and thank you for 
this wise conclusion that the maximum use of force is in no way incompatible for the maximum use of the intellect. Thank you. So it's now time to, uh, we, we, sorry, we won't have time to take questions for uh, keynote addresses. Uh, we will uh, get questions this afternoon uh, during round tables. Um, so having heard discussions this morning regarding political, strategic, and capability development issues regarding the synchronization of tempos, uh, it is now time to focus on what Professor Olson uh, depicted in his, in his uh, bottom right corner, the cross-domain integration. Uh, so we're going to look at operational aspects of the question of synchronization. That will be the driver of this afternoon's agenda. So our next panel will discuss the joint engagement under the moderation of Dr. Sinmarie, called Rafkilde, from the Danish Institute of International Studies from Denmark. Dr. Rafkilde's research focuses on what she labels contemporary interventionism um, and particularly conflict borders and terrorism in West Africa's Sahel region. She has worked on many articles, studies, and research, and have been published in many journals worldwide, such as International Affairs, uh, Progress in International Development Studies. Before I hand her the mic so that she can uh, introduce this topic more in depth and the speakers of this roundtable, uh, I'll pose to remind you the way to ask questions. So for people online, you can ask questions through the YouTube feed or using the Twitter hashtag EI2 Airspace Power. For people in the room, you can either use these two media or you can also use the numbers that are depicted on the aisle. You text your question to this number. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Ron Kilda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to the organizers. Please, the, the, the panelists, could you please come up and take the seat? We're very happy to be here at this very important topic and to welcome you to the roundtable three on joint all domain engagements, air and space effects. As we have heard uh, during previous sessions and also now with uh, Jon Andreasen's um, uh, suggestions to be very intellectual sharp. I think we will uh, try to accommodate that. Um, but um, we have also discussed that we are rapidly moving into an era of more unpredictability due to shifting global st power structures with changing perceptions of threats and willingness to use force. Beyond global and regional powers, we also see non-state actors that are increasingly engaged in hybrid warfares. And finally, security threats today are shaped by new digital and technological development. These trends, of course, pose both challenges and opportunities for joint military action and the integration of air and space power into joint maneuver in also potential new international coalitions like the EII um, initiative. In this roundtable, um, our very distinguished speakers, which will speak based on their very long-term operational experiences. Any one of them has more than 20, some almost 30 years of experiences in the field. Um, we are going to discuss different country cases approaches to uh, the coordination of joint all domain engagements with ex uh, examples from the UK, from Italy, from Finland, and from France. Um, the speakers, in virtue of their experience, will all discuss questions of how to uh, combine the strategic, operational, tactical effects of air uh, and space power with the effects of other services in other domains, that is, this multi-domain engagement, and why also 
an airspace and cyber multimedia, multi-field approach will be paramount in the future. But also, as also very um, pointed to by our keynote speaker, um, also some of perhaps the unintended effects and the ethical questions that this uh, new uh, domains uh, will bring about. So let me first uh, introduce our distinguished uh, speakers. Um, first, we have Air Commodore Tom Burke from the UK Royal Air Forces. He is Assistant Chief of Staff Operations in the Royal UK Air Force. He is a trained weapons system officer. He has flew various operations, including Iraq uh, and the former Republic of Yugoslavia. He has strong experience also with Reaper drone operations as squadron commander on various occasions, as well as he has been base commander in Waddington. From Italy, our second speaker is Colonel Filippo uh, Sampella, commander of the Italian Warfare Center. Um, Filippo is also a trained weapon system officer with long-term operational experience. He has commanded fighter squadrons. He has been base commander in Italy. He has carried out exchange programs with Germany. And finally, last but not least, he has very strong experience in various NATO, NATO operations and HQs. Third, from Finland, we have Colonel Saku Jukas, I hope I pronounced that right, who is Chief of Plants Air Force Command. He's a fighter pilot with more than 3,000 hours of flight experience in operational fighter squadrons. He's previously been commanding officers of flight test centers. He's been head of air warfare studies and deputy chief of Air Force Intelligence. Finally, last but not least, we have Brigadier General Cherry Garetta, who is Deputy Commander of the French Joint Operation HQ. As a fighter, fighter pilot by training, during more than 26 years of uh, service, Brigadier General Garetta has also strong international experience with various French and international uh, operations, both in Africa and in Afghanistan, amongst others and he's also been squadron commander and base commander. And this is just a few highlights from their very impressive CVs. So before I give the floor to our first speakers, Tom Burke, please uh, use the um, telephone numbers to um, uh, allow for some questions. And I've promised that we'll keep the presentations very brief with ten, uh, only seven minutes, and I will raise this card once time is up. So we have uh, now time for a little bit of interaction and questions from you and the audiences online as well. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Sean. And thank you, uh, Julian and Richard, for putting on uh, such a, uh, an excellent um, conference today. Uh, so I'll be quick. So my, my two key words are tempo and integration. I think uh, in framing the multi-domain integration issue, we have to be realistic and, uh, and state that we are in the early days of getting it right. So a lot of what you're going to hear today, I think, is going to be more about uh, framing a problem rather than finding a solution. Um, clearly, there's strong alignment amongst, um, amongst many of the European nations around the problems that we all face, all of us. Uh, we have common challenges, uh, and it's clear that we Europeans must uh, cooperate and innovate um, to, uh, to stay in the game. Um, as, the, uh, as Colonel Olsen just said in, uh, in Norway, this problem encapsulates the, the physical, the moral, and the conceptual components of fighting power, so it's a multidimensional issue. I would say that uh, the Air Forces have a practical utility that the politicians love, uh, and we should be rightly proud of our contribution to the joint campaign. That will continue, but we must stay relevant. I would say uh, the future is bright, and you will um, recall the words this morning of, uh, of um, General Pariso and also uh, of General Levine in highlighting the fact that um, air power is known for um, its ability to tra be transformative in the campaign particularly bringing agility and strength. We also uh, are very proud of ourselves as aviators in our ability to interact with the other components, uh, whether that's through air, land integration, air maritime, 
as cyber, as space, or as special operations, um, we are sort of the Swiss Army knife often in the campaign tool set. But we must continue to be uh, ambitious and audacious. I agree strongly with uh, comments made earlier by uh, Monsieur Trappier that uh, we must bring tempo into everything that we do, and that is going to be a significant challenge for us over the next 10 years. Clearly, tempo in our operations to maintain the initiative, in our acquisition and in our innovation systems, uh, and if you want to pay a visit to uh, the Royal Air Force Rapid Capability Office, you will see how we're trying to do that in action in concert with, uh, with colleagues um, in the Royal Navy. Uh, we must be, uh, bring tempo to our operational deployments in what many of you will know as dynamic force employment, and we must be uh, equally agile in our concept development and in our uh, logistics. So there must be tempo in everything that we do in order that we remain both relevant and ready for the next challenge. Hello. I guess uh, you, will, um, you will all be familiar with working in components, and I kind of want to throw a, a bit of a challenge out for this discussion today, which will, will say that perhaps we've become too, com too comfortable in componency. Uh, and we have to question whether that system that we've known and loved for the last 30 years will still be relevant to the joint fight um, in the next 10 years. Or maybe the challenge of multi-domain integration means that we need to think differently. And this is a, this is a really difficult question. Uh, so I'm going to just blaze through a few things that have happened on my side of the channel um, that have happened in the last couple of years which have got us to a point where we're thinking perhaps differently about our place and what air power offers. IOPC was the integrated operating concept which really um, looked at how we are configured against the modern threats that we encounter. So if you imagine a force that is generally arranged around contingency and war fighting, Perhaps we should consider being um, arranged more around the operate function that we, as we conduct operations every single day with a readiness to step to war fighting. Now you may think that we already do that, but um, I, th I think uh, through that spectrum of uh, protect, engage and constrain, that is what we call operating in, in, this, uh, in this conceptual model. And then, um, and then the ability to transition to fight. The chart on the right just shows some of the things, some of those challenges that, uh, that came out of that analysis. Next slide, please. So we also conducted an integrated security review uh, that highlighted a, a few things about uh, where the UK, actually, for a lot of what we've heard from uh, the French speakers uh, today, indicates that thinking is, uh, is very strongly aligned um, in that we will, uh, we will be um, uh, persistently engaged forward and constantly in partnership clearly with NATO at the core, but in other areas uh, with the CGEF, with France, with the Joint Expeditionary Force, with our uh, northern colleagues, um, and of course um, we need to be involved in um, fora like this in the, uh, in the E2I, as Mr. Um, Berenger said earlier, in order to anticipate and to have strategic empathy with each other. Also what came out of our uh, review was that we needed to modernize some capabilities and you may have seen announcements of some of the, some of the platforms that we have uh, sunsetted uh, and we're replacing with other more modern, more digitally enabled capabilities uh, over the next couple of years. Um, integration is a constant theme which we're going to explore a bit further here and then, um, and then innovation and experimentation are a major up arrow for us with significant investments in uh, research and development. Next slide please. I think the next group is going to talk about, um, about what the air response to this kind of analysis would be. So I'm going to dance through uh, this slide as we just go to the final one, please. So it's a big challenge. We're on a journey to get from joint operations. Traditionally, joint operations is something that uh, happens at the operational level of war to drive down into integrated multi-domain operations right down at the, uh, at the tactical level throughout the organization. And I guess uh, we're going to talk a lot about interoperability over the next day and a half, um, not just in common uh, tactics, techniques and procedures, uh, but also in common data standards, the way we move information around the battlefield between uh, environments in a seamless manner is a huge uh, challenge and a, uh, and, a, and a difficult network architecture issue. 
And we've also, I think, got to get better at some of the, um, some of the things that we were doing perhaps 20 years ago in our intro physical interoperability of our forces, our ability to engineer, service, and, um, and, and host each other's uh, air platforms in a, in a more agile manner. Most of you will be involved in uh, some form of agile combat employment program. Certainly, uh, the Royal Air Force is, is um, putting in a big four-year commitment to making our combat air force, ISR, and air mobility um, platforms um, more agile. So, in conclusion, um, there's quite a lot that, uh, that needs to happen over the, uh, over the next couple of years to realize the ambition of multi-domain integration. And I would not say that that is going to be something that's easy uh, for us to achieve, because we would have done it already otherwise. Um, is there one more slide? That's it. Okay, um, I will think hand over there and we can take questions on everything else next. So is it uh, Filippo next? Please, Filippo. Thanks very much, Tom Beck, <laughs> for bringing some of the challenges for all the main integration up. And please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, let me thank, let me say that I'm very honored to be here. And uh, I just will follow what Tom has just said and explain a little bit the Italian approach to, uh, to join all domain operation or multi-domain operation. First of all, let me uh, spend 30 seconds about the name. Uh, sometimes we heard about like multi-domain operation, join all domain operation. Uh, actually, Italy is still waiting for NATO to have like a, um, a clear doctrine, a clear name. For us, it's, it's, they're making no big difference. We prefer join all domain operation, but I mean, we may use multi-domain operation. So for the name for us doesn't change a lot. Can we go with the slides? For next, please. Before going to the future, I want to go about current doctrine. Right now, that's the doctrine we use. Operational guy knows these slides very well. We use uh, following the NATO doctrine, so supporting supported commander uh, with orders coming up in a synchronized board, and it works. So I would say, why we need to work? Why we need to change something that it works? And that's the question we are uh, working around. So next, we heard this morning that what is changing is the enemy, is the threats. One thing, apart from all the good things we listened to this morning, one thing which is very important for us, uh, we need to, I always stress to my uh, commanders, is that what we are not used as operational guys is to think that there can be effects not only in the physical dimension which we are used. We drop the bomb or the enemy drop the bomb and there is a physical aspect but there are also effects in the virtual and in cognitive areas. And we are, as military, we are less used to this kind of effects. So that's something that we need to evolve and we need to think, as our Norwegian colleague said before, we need to think doctrinally how we in the military can also think about cognitive and um, virtual effects. Next slide, please. So for us in Italy, the answer is join an old domain. And again, uh, it's difficult to think about it. We are used air, flies, uh, the land people move on the ground, the maritime people is at sea. We need to evolve a little bit. We need to take also cyberspace and space in consideration and we need to think at the electromagnetic spectrum. So we start to uh, train a generation of new uh, guys, of new, new operation, uh, operational guy in a different approach. Next. Really, uh, what is changing? You have like what we saw in the past and what we are looking in the future. Is two points I would like to highlight in this slide. First of all, each command, component command is clear to have effects also in other domains. This is easy for us in the Air Force, it's a little bit more complex for people from the ground and from the land, but we need to think not only to drop, a, as I said before, to drop a bombs 
for us in the air over the land is to take effects, effects which again, and, and I stress this because for us is one key point in the cognitive and in the virtual uh, dimension. And one thing I would like also to stress is that we start to train a new generation of guy thinking not only at kinetic effects, but non-kinetic effects, which is very important under a unified command. So we do not uh, need to uh, think, uh, again, just as component commands, but we need to think as a joint force, which is difficult for us, especially for old guys like me who uh, grew up under uh, a component command just thinking air as air. Next, I will leave a couple of seconds. This is a um, quote from uh, US, uh, from the chief of US Air Force a few years ago. And again, joint L domain, com domain operation are not joint operation. That's different and that's what we as the Italian Air Warfare Center are working as a doctrine to differentiate joint ops from joint all domain ops which are taking us to a different level. Next, so if we want to, in the few uh, next slide, just to concentrate what change in air C2, and I'm coming from the um, C2 center in Italy, from uh, uh, command and control uh, center in Italy. First of all is what we call mission command. This is, no, uh, is not a new theory, it's not a new uh, doctrine, it was already uh, used by the Prussian uh, army in the 18th centuries. That's meant to delegate, to give the authority to lower echelon. First of all, the commanders just will have the chance to do his commander intent and to give his order, very broad order, to other echelons which are distributed. So that's why we are calling about distributed control. We need to give more control to echelons. We need to, uh, we need to follow mission type orders. We need to give broader orders as command to echelons. And we need to also distribute these orders to tactical units on the ground. They need to have the authority and the flexibility and the delegation to do whatever is needed at the moment. Uh, I always uh, remind me what I heard in the States about talking about multi-domain operation. We need to act at the speed of, uh, speed of light against an enemy, which is at the speed of sound. That's the only way to win the war. So next, and another thing which is very important, we are working uh, also with the industry, is to talk is about combat cloud. We heard this morning, we heard people from industry talking this morning. This is very important. Uh, links are good. Today we are used to link 22, link 16, but they are just point-to-point -point communication with geographical, sometimes geographical restriction. We need to take combat clouds that everybody can use all over the world. We need to think a very extended air uh, operation area of responsibility. So we need to have clouds. And this is important. That's something we need to spend our money on. We need to spend our money and our ideas on artificial intelligence. So to close, I always like the next slide, please. This example. This is not my example I heard in the States. So maybe my American colleagues already have a good uh, version of this from more illustrious uh, speakers. And this is the Uber and Waze uh, example that I always like to bring in this kind of talks about multi-domain or joint domain operation. Think about how 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we used to call a taxi. We call the central station, there was uh, an operator responding to us. Then we say, we need a taxi over there. She used to call all the taxi drivers around she received an unverified position from the taxi driver and based on her calculation or his calculation on an unverified position, he or she used to send us a taxi. So a lot of communication, a lot of time spent and some unverified information based for uh, which uh, we're basing which taxis to send. Think about Uber right now. In your app, so in a combat cloud in the internet, you put your position, 
you put your destination, and you have on the slide on the left the effects. You have the you have the you have your route, and you have the effects. The closest drive arrived to you, and you have already have on the screen the how much you're gonna pay. Waze is the same idea as Pan. It is a Google Navigator, but you have a lot of inputs from every uh, drive around. So every sensor, each sensor is a shooter, as we used to say, we're talking about multi-domain operation. And especially you can filter the data. There are a lot of data on Waze, but you can filter and just take the data which are important for you. So if you are a tactical unit, you will use data. If you are a commander, you will use other data. Next slide. And just to conclude, this I quote from General Holmes, Commander at Com Air Combat Command in 2020. Again, to win this enemy, we need to have a tempo they can keep with, and we need to post our enemies a lot of dilemmas. Let's conclude my, my part. Thank you for your attention. I'll give to... Okay, thank you. Do we have uh, slides. Meanwhile, they are loading. So, general, dear audience, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, on my, my behalf also. Uh, I would like to bring a little bit different perspective on the table, and that's the, the Finnish perspective, maybe a little smaller perspective than the others. So I start by a few keynotes. Uh, Finland, it's a small and non-allied country uh, with strong national support but somewhat limited resources and therefore we must uh, build our capabilities by perseverance. Uh, we concentrate on the key areas and they are force generation capability, command and control and uh, threshold weapon systems. We need to align them together with a coherent fighting do doctrine. And, and the fighting doctrine describes the operations and the integration of time forces and the effects. And the Finnish forces fighting doctrine are the field manuals and they are actually pretty close to, for example, NATO uh, ones. <coughs> well, then, uh, about the environment. Notably, there are some individual specialties in, in Finnish operational environment. And the way to implement the air power integration, it differs substantially from the theaters we have seen uh, in the last decades of coin operations. Air power integration in highly contested areas, that it requires totally different approach to risk management, simplicity, and communication requirements. The Finnish way to this is to pursue for a holistic approach. Uh, we do it by a derivation and the deri derivative steps are the dot mil five steps. And I want to emphasize a few of them. First, the doctrine. We need to align and synchronize the doctrine family, as stated in previous. Organizations. Service and service organizations, they need to be unified, not only by strong liaisons, but also by unified communications. Material, every sensor is a shooter, every shooter is a sensor. So we must acquire only compatible material. And finally, interoperability. Today, all this could be done by utilizing digital communications, and especially by utilizing multicasting, IP-based digital communications. The third offset is the data. Well then, uh, the Finnish solution, as stated previously, we have our own uniquities. Uh, the Finnish military doctrine is based on the concept of total defense. The stronghold is a full-scale conscription and the large-scale reservist army. Though, due to wide AOR, we do maintain some selected spearhead capabilities, which are highly technical in nature and mainly operated by Air Force. The Air Force missions are to uphold territorial integrity, create deterrence, and gain and maintain the control of the air and attack if needed. Then, today, 
the Air Force, the Air Force integrates the effects of air defense, the fight operations, long-range kinetic effects, as well as targeting supporting parts. The Air Force provides cover to the field army as well as the Navy and strikes to enhance the operational tempo. Closer support and joint fires are enabled by utilizing the effect of both the 1500-gun artillery and the Air Force weapons. And that's today, but tomorrow we also seek to obtain certain well-picked space capabilities. And affordable is the key word. An affordable solution might be to enable space situational awareness missions by implementing space surveillance and tracking and space weather capabilities. Position, navigation and timing. Precision navigation needs to be secured and it also needs to be secured by duplicating it with non-GPS dependent means. And finally, tomorrow we also seek the next generation air warfare capability by our HX fighter replacement program and the Naval Squadron 2020 acquisition program. These next generation systems, they will provide us with all domain capabilities. And this will highlight the emphasis and the importance of joint ISR. We will be able to enhance the operational tempo, but via joint utilization of the data and only via joint utilization of the data. And finally, the rapid but flexible use of the air power effects. Thank you very much. Well, I will give you the French point of view. So after speaking about strategy, technology, I will give you some examples of our joint operations, current operations. And to begin with, I will give you the, the context uh, of our involvement in operations. We are involved against mainly two threats. We have terrorist threat, uh, which are divided into group ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And the other threat are strategic competitors, main strategic competitors. And we, we could say that uh, Russia, China, Iran are our uh, strategic competitors. And in this context, we are involved in, uh, we engage about 26,000 people in our uh, operation, in a status operational, and uh, roughly 13,000 outside of France in the theater of operations nowadays. So we are involved in a United, Ma United Nations mission, like uh, MINUSMA in Mali. We are involved in uh, European Union missions, like uh, UTM or IRINI in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in international coalition, like uh, Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq, and of course national-led uh, mission like Barkhane or uh, led coalition uh, like Takuba, which is uh, the recent coalition in Mali. So in this context, uh, what, is, uh, what can be an illustration of air power and air capacity, in, uh, especially uh, in support or uh, with the land forces uh, as an example of a good airland integration. In Mali or in the vicinity of Mali, in the Barkhane operation, we have about seven uh, fighter aircraft that are based in uh, Niamey, in Niger. And we are involved every day in a QRA for four countries, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Chad. And they are engaged every day in this mission of QRA. And uh, we had yesterday an attack in the center of Mali, in Gossi village, which is uh, right in the middle of the combat area. And we sent some mirage because there was an uh, attack, suicide attack, bombing attack on our troops. We had some, uh, some guys went in there uh, yesterday. So it is uh, a main engagement of our fighters in this uh, airland integration every day. We have also uh, ISR assets uh, like uh, Reapers. We have six Reapers. And we have also four uh, Beechcraft uh, dedicated ISR aircraft. Uh, dedicated mainly to special forces in order to, to find, fix, track the, the high value individuals. And uh, this, is, uh, this is really a very good asset to do that in this uh, desert area where we don't have uh, so uh, human intelligent, intelligence. We need those assets flying over. 
We have also air mobility, of course, because we are speaking about thousands of kilometers of combat area. And we have uh, about six transport aircraft, F-400M, the C-130, C-160, CN-235, and two tankers, in order to make this operation, land operation, possible because of the thousands of kilometers uh, of the area. And, of course, we have about 20 uh, helicopters. We have uh, Royal Air Force helicopters with us, Chinook in Mali, in Gao. And uh, they're mainly dedicated to move the troops on the ground for uh, QRA and also for the medical evacuation, which is uh, also a, a key element in this operation. So to sum up with the, the air and land integration in our Barkhane operation and East vicinity, I will say that uh, fighters and medevac uh, are really key factors for our African allies because they don't have those assets. It's very important for us and for them to give them, to give them those uh, rare assets in Africa. And uh, for us, ISR and air mobility are really our two factors in this airline integration because of the wideness of the area and the specific uh, threat very difficult to find and fix in this area. Now to speak about uh, air and naval integration, uh, I will take the example of the IRINI operation which is a European Union operation dedicated to control the arms uh, weapons traffic uh, in bound Libya, where we have uh, an equator in Italy, in, uh, in Rome, in Roma, and we work with uh, Italian, of course, Spanish, Germans, uh, to control traffic on the sea and also in the air. And recently, we plan a mission with an AWACS and a Reaper uh, dedicated to ISR, and a frigate. So we have these three assets, uh, two in the air, one on the sea, and uh, the AWACS were, was looking to the maritime picture and is very efficient at that to find the boats and then sending the Reaper on the boats to control the, the cargo uh, and, to, to, and to control the identity and then to give the, the full mission video to the boat to intercept the dedicated pit boat. So it was, uh, I think, a, a very good example of our air and navy integration in our uh, in a European Union operation. Of course, we are also involved in a reassurance mission and ISR mission in the borders of a, a European area in the in the context and the status of NATO mission uh, in Black Sea, for example, or North Atlantic or Mediterranean Sea. So I will say as a keynote that uh, interoperability, interoperability uh, of our CIS is the key factor with the Navy because we, we have the same approach of the threat but we need to speak uh, very, uh, with very accuracy and reactivity together. So it's a, it's a key factor with CIS. Then in, uh, in the context of the multi-domain operation, I will uh, illustrate the, what we feel as a field, a domain of uh, multi-domain operation, the influence, so the strategic communication. Um, I feel that the air assets in joint operation and multi-domain operation, multi operation is a key asset also, a, the perfect asset when it's doing a show of force, for example. I will give you a, a small example. We had some troops uh, in uh, Central Africa, in Bangui, that were threatened by rebels uh, descending to the capital. Uh, and so we sent uh, two Mirage from Chad to the Central Africa in Bangui in order to perform show of force on, in the vicinity of our troops. And the message was very clear for the rebels descending, don't touch to the French guys. So this is, I think, the best image to illustrate the, the strategic communication with an air assets. We can do it also with in the, the nuclear deterrence we, uh, with the air asset where you are able to show your airstrike, you are able to retrograde your airstrike so you can have a dialogue with your strategic competitors thanks to air assets. So it's another example of our operation with that. We are doing four missions like that. We call it poker mission. 
and uh, we play with our competitors uh, four, years, four, four times in a year. Uh, another domain is space domain, of course. Uh, we integrated the space command in Air Force, but we also integrated a specific division in our uh, joint HQ in Paris to integrate all the fields of the space. And to conclude, I will say that air, powers, air power is a key factor our, in our current and future operation. In rough environment like uh, Sahara Desert, and also in high-level and technolo technological environment in front of strategic competitors. Thank you. Thank you to all of our four speakers to give very interesting insights on the very operational level. We now have uh, 15 minutes left and I have um, already received some questions. So I think what I will do is that I will um, raise three questions and then please uh, feel free to um, answer all of them. Um, I think uh, it's very interesting also to hear from the very concrete experiences in Mali. I think what um, was sometimes raised was this question of everybody likes to coordinate, but no one likes to be coordinated. So maybe from your experience, how do you actually think about this with these different um, uh, compartmentalized forces? How do you actually do the um, um, coordination in practice? Maybe you could provide some insights from your experiences. Then we have a question from the audience, which is, which operations have shown successes, but also improvement areas in terms of joint actions between different army corps, but also between allies, bringing this relevance of the international and uh, collaboration into play. And then the se uh, a third question is, could we imagine that in a perspective of coordination, a multi-domain C2 could be deployed in order to manage a crisis that may arise. And finally, how do you consider the implementation of a common coordinated digital close air support? So if you mark, um, feel free to address the question that you find most pertinent and let me know if you want to, me to repeat any of them. The, the final one is how does the coordination of joint engagement uh, with political objective work in coalition? Oh, that was actually another question coming in. It's quite, uh, okay, let's just, um, yeah, there, there, there are many questions coming in. So I think we will just, uh, the third one you asked for is how do you consider the implementation of a common coordinated digital close air support? Should we start with that one? Okay. Does anyone feel? Well, I would say the, the value of a digital a, a assisted close air support is clear in, uh, in practice and in, in trials as well. So I think we find that it reduces the, the time to effect by up to 80%. So um, it's a good example of um, moving away from a, perhaps a, um, a rather old-fashioned um, way of doing business and moving on to your uh, Waze or your uh, Uber example um, where you're matching um, sensors to shooters or to uh, effectors. Um, so it's definitely a, uh, an area that needs um, investment and then the development of common uh, TTPs and uh, uh, data solutions. Thank you. I can take on this one also. Uh, the digital CAS, I see it as an, an enable, enabler. Uh, an example, I've been, I've been working lots with uh, British JTAX and, and they are pain in the ass. So it really helps when it comes to interoperability because you can, you can counter like language problems or, or non-standard uh, protocols or, or, or things that people might do differently. So when you go digital, you have the certain way of doing things and, and it makes it lots easier. And of course, it cuts the time, which is the most important thing. Thank you. Colonel Sampela, did you have something to add on the digital close no. air support? No, not much. I was interested a little bit in the 
question before, so I think uh, when we start, there was okay. just one, the one before. Could we imagine that in a perspective of coordination, a multi-domain C2 could be deployed in order to manage crises that may arise? Well, that's uh, very like that's a question I really like a lot because we spend a lot of time doctrinally. So we are not talking about the way we will develop, but doctrinally, we th uh, we talked about this aspect because really we think the multi-domain will be used just against a peer competitor. So we don't think that since multi-domain is uh, very uh, required a lot of efforts, require a lot of um, a lot of fund funding and a lot, a lot of um, have really a lot of efforts. We think that we need to think about multi-domain just for not only the operation but for uh, big crisis or I would say uh, opposing uh, uh, peer competitors. So when we talk about crisis, the example I flashed in my first slide about what we use in today is still very valid. But uh, again, this is how in Italy we think doctrinally. It may evolve in the future, but right now we don't see to use it for very small local operation. Do you have a comment on that question? Otherwise, I think it would be interesting also not to uh, forget this question of coordination because this is something that people are asking about. How does coordination of joint engagement with political objectives works in these kind of coalitions. And also perhaps the last question, and then we will take the round again, could be this uh, aspect of uh, big practices and cases of success where it has actually worked. Yes, I'll let you uh, start. Difficult question. Uh, of course, coordination is the, is the key element because we have uh, many population, different population coming from land, air, sea, and uh, other domains. You have uh, different technologies, different doctrines, and you have to join up uh, in a very short term in a specific area and to make all the things uh, work together with uh, media elements, political elements above. So, so I will say that uh, that's, uh, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And uh, of course, it's not easy because you have uh, people thinking different. But uh, as far as there are um, few assets and few people, the, the only way to do it is to, is to gather and to work together. So uh, what is interesting is that uh, it's sometimes easier to work with another airman from a, another country than to work with the army guy of uh, your country. But uh, anyway, anyway we, we can do it and, uh, and more and more we are, um, we are more efficient uh, together to, to work uh, with that because of this uh, all these uh, studies and uh, theory of multi-domain operation that now are very well uh, uh, accepted and uh, by, by by the, the different uh, components our different components. Jacob, would you please uh, would you like to comment on it? Uh, okay, Philippe, do you have any uh, further comments on Tom Burke then? So, I mean, you asked for an example. We've, uh, we've got a carrier in the Eastern Mediterranean um, for the last few weeks and on its way east. Um, coordination is still conducted at the operational level, um, but there is powerful capabilities on board that vessel. Um, we, the air component, support around um, it as well with either tankers or ISR platforms or, um, you know, for example, our fighters that are... Um, currently flying an, a NATO force um, enhanced air policing mission in, uh, in, um, in Romania. Um, and we, we are interacting with that carrier task force as it sails through and or clearly it has its own F-35s embarked as well. So um, if you were to go to the multi-domain operation center that we, that we are building in where, where I come from, um, on that floor you will see um, not only um, aviators but also People from the, uh, from the from the cyber world, from other government departments, and also um, from from the space force. So um, th there are examples of multi-domain operations happening, even at the tactical component level, um, right now. And I, and I don't mean that to back to your original question. I don't mean that in the sense of 
you know, it's a war, you know, it's a war fighting, it's a crisis. This is global routine operations that are happening every day um, in uh, in NATO's vigilance areas. So I think it's a reality, but it's um, it's definitely an area that is uh, gaining pace, and uh, it's already showing um, fruit in um, in, uh, in in the results. But uh, but back to the basic question is that the coordination um, is still primarily at the operational level. Okay, uh, does any of you have any further comments? We still have two minutes left, otherwise I think we're gonna wrap up the session right on time. Um, thank you. Yeah. Just, just to make a parallel with the, the panel before us, with the Android and industrial guys, you know, they were speaking about uh, cooperation in industry. I think it's, we can make a parallel with the cooperation with the different components, because y you have something to do you know how to do it, you have the instruments to do it, you have the capacity to do it. And at the end, you have a political will to make you work together and you have to find a solution to make all the components and the capacity work together, even if it is not your purpose, personal purpose, you have to do it. So I will, I will do this parallel with uh, the industrial world. Thank you for bringing that parallel in. I thought you, uh, that stirred some ideas, please. No, just one thing I, I wanted to add, which was um, we're finding it takes four or five years to train a, a really good, high quality data analyst. Uh, and th the workforce that we have now is not the workforce that we need in 2025. So the building begins really for those long lead items to, to build those skills into our workforce. Um, there is amazing talent out there, I would say, already hidden amongst you, we've, we have found some real fantastic aptitude, and I think we're all finding that. But if we're growing people from when they, uh, when they enter the organization, now is the time to, uh, to be thinking um, of what skills we need to build in. Felipe. Just to close, in, uh, in Italy we just trained the first two we call uh, chief data analysts. They will be put as a consultant of the commander like the legal and the political, we will have a chief data because really uh, the commanders need to filter the data. Filtering the data, understand which data uh, to use is very difficult. The normal example we take is that if you think about uh, President Bush on uh, Air Force One during the 11 uh, September 2001, he had uh, we, right now, on our cell phone, we have 10,000 times the amount of information he had. So with all this the information, you need to filter. Otherwise, the, the command will be overwhelmed. Colonel Jukas, please. And just a small note on that, that uh, we need to be really on the line when we are recruiting people, because at least in Finland, we are, we are lacking of personnel, and uh, we are competing on the same people on every level, and, and, and civilian market and, and military market and that affects our joint engagement capability, naturally. Thank you for bringing the question of human resources in. I think we actually have time for the last question that just came up. Um, we have two minutes left. Um, it is how to deal with complexity in MDO, given the increasing amount of data to be exchanged. What can be done to lift the fog of war? drawing on Klausovich, and what can be the role of air and space power in dealing with this specific issue? It's a very challenging question, I think. <laughs> um. yeah, again, we talk about the data. Data is becoming one of the key factors. The other key factor for us is artificial intelligence. Uh, we need to use it because we need to uh, change the way we are uh, form. Actually, we are using our uh, component commanders. We have a lot of people, for example, if you think uh, intelligence analysts, right now, and the Americans prove to be effective, we can use uh, artificial intelligence to look at hours and hours of videos. And we can, uh, we can transform those guys in other opera operators. We can send them to do other jobs, which in the future can be more valuable. That's one part of the answer. Tom, I don't know. A long question, but uh, like I would like to give a reminder back that if we are operating with persons, soldiers, they need a mission and they need a task. So finally, you have to put it all together and make it a mission and then make it a task. 
Yeah, I was just going to agree with you, Filippo, actually. So, uh, yeah, well said. Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for your very interesting insights on the challenges and opportunities of joint or domain engagements. And uh, thank you also for some very interesting questions. It has been a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, your uh, speeches, your insight for this roundtable, and thank you, Dr. Cole Van, Van Kilder, for having moderated it. Uh, we have now scheduled a comfort break, so we'll uh, pass some video for the people online, and for those in the room, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a break. For 10 minutes, please be back in your seats at uh, 15.30. It's a profession that starts with an A. A is for airplane, A is for aerial, and A is for aeronautics. But also, A is for Clément Adair, for aviators, for all those who, over the past 150 years, have turned the dream of flight into a reality. A is also for achievement. Today, the aeronautics sector employs 194,000 people in France, a strong economic force focused on international horizons. An industry built on knowledge and expertise from both large established corporations and small innovative companies working hand in hand. And so, A is for ambition, because tomorrow, even more so than today, humans are opening up to the world, moving and coming closer to one another, and airplanes will carry them there. On air with an I. I is for Icarus, of course. I is for intelligence, and I is for innovation. Because innovative advances in research and development are at the basic foundations of the French aviation and aerospace industry. Because for over 50 years, the biggest successes in the sector are a result of innovation. Every year, the French aeronautic industry files several thousand patents and invests over 1 billion euros in production equipment. And finally, on air with an R. R is for responsibility, because French aeronautic companies are fully aware of their social and environmental responsibilities. This is why the industry pays careful attention to security and safety. This is why it invests in new territories, where it supports high-tech industry and develops skill sets that are essential to its future. This is why it launches programs that will help reduce even more the impact of air travel on the environment, protecting resources, and creating an aeronautic industry that respects our planet and the people who live on it.
Good afternoon once again. Welcome back after the break. We are now down to round table four, uh, which will now address combined aspect of force development and discuss the questions of plug and fight expeditionary mindset that General Lavigne attributed this morning to his German counterpart. To moderate the discussions of experts from the UK, Denmark, France, and Germany, join me in welcoming Dr. Fleming Spilsbol Hansen from the Danish Institute for International Studies. Dan Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Uh, Spilsbol Hansen won't be able to join us today, uh, but he will do the moderation online via Zoom. Before joining DIIS, Dr. Hansen served as head of the political military department at the OSCE office in Tajikistan as a secondi from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then as an acting director uh, at the University, at the Border Management Staff College, also at the OSCE in Tajikistan. Before this, Dr. Hansen was with the University of Copenhagen and the Central European University in Budapest. He served as research director at the Danish Defense College and as, a, and as an analyst at the Defense Intelligence Service. Dr. Hansen will introduce his uh, panelists. Before I hand him the mic, I'd like to remind you to ask your questions either through the YouTube feed on the French and Space Force YouTube channel, through Twitter hashtag EI2 Airspace Power, or for the people in the room sending text message of the number depicted on the aisle. Dr. Splitball Hansen, the mic is yours. Thank you for this. Thank you for your uh, kind introduction and for your warm welcome. Um, as you can see, I'm online. I am uh, moderating this panel from uh, the comfort of my own home in Copenhagen. And uh, because, well, similar to so many others, it's because of uh, Corona restrictions, of course, which uh, now uh, prohibit me from, uh, from going. But I'm very pleased to be able to join you online. And I'm very pleased and proud, of course, to uh, moderate this uh, important session. Um, you've already covered quite a lot of ground uh, this morning, and now it's time to turn to uh, plug and play, or of course, plug and fight, uh, which we know is uh, increasingly important. It's been recognized already for a few decades, the expeditionary air force, the ability to go out and be ready uh, at short notice uh, to fight, first in a unilateral session uh, within the armed forces of just one country, and then increasingly, of course, in multinational settings. This is also why today we have a broad uh, panel, we have a broad roundtable, uh, including four different countries, to bring you different perspectives, both from a national setting, of course, but also from the international setting, uh, where different partners will need to work together. And we will learn more of this, of course, uh, during the uh, time of this workshop. Uh, but some of the issues that are important, of course, center around the topic of interoperability. So various types of interoperability that we encounter, increasingly complex missions uh, that uh, demand still more of our attention and still greater preparation uh, to enable us to uh, to plan and to execute and monitor ex uh, and evaluate uh, subsequently some of these uh, campaigns that we do. And some of the issues that we're looking at, of course, would be uh, procedural interoperability. How do different air forces work? Uh, what are the procedures by which they operate? And how do we bring this together? We're familiar, of course, also with uh, technical interoperability, some of the problems of technological gaps when you bring together uh, different air forces, uh, high, highly complex operations, and they need to work together. 
Uh, one of the things that interests me personally is the development of artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence will also be increasingly incorporated uh, by air forces around the world. Uh, we know, of course, because all air force uh, staff always at the very frontier of technological developments, we also see, for instance, that artificial intelligence is already incorporated and will increasingly be incorporated into air power thinking. And that is very important also for the topic that we'll be discussing today, as we may see that certain states will have an advantage over other states, and we know that uh, artificial intelligence may be one of these offset strategies that will create quite a distance between the leading states and those states that are somewhat behind, maybe just slightly behind, but at least uh, behind. We have problems or challenges of rules of engagement, also uh, something that we may perhaps learn more about today during this uh, round table. Uh, rules of engagement, when you bring together very different air forces with very different uh, cultures, uh, resting on very different strategic cultures about the way they think about the use of air power and what air power may do. Uh, and of course, we have in a broader sense, cultural linguistic uh, challenges also. So quite a lot of issues to, uh, to be covered today. So I hope, but let's see what our panelists will bring to us today. We have, as I said in the introduction, a very experienced, a, a very broad panel for you. Um, you have the bios. We have some very distinguished speakers and the bios are very impressive. So I'll just introduce them very briefly and you may refer uh, to uh, the material, of course, that has been uh, handed out. But let me say that we have four different speakers. We will start with Group Captain Andrew Chas Dickens uh, from the UK, uh, where he uh, now also serves in a uh, supervisory capacity when it comes to uh, the development of Air Force and the training of new pilots. Uh, we turn to Denmark, we have Colonel uh, Peter Mel Melgaard, who is also a former uh, pilot and who is now involved in the development of future Danish Air Force. Uh, very interesting uh, person for me, of course, also. We go to France, we have Air, uh, Rear Admiral Avi Amelien, uh, who has uh, carrier experience and who will be bringing this uh, to the panel. And finally, we go to Germany to Brigadier General Burkhard Patotsky, uh, who will bring a uh, German perspective uh, to uh, add sort of a final element to, uh, to our discussion, which will bring together, as I said, uh, the experience from uh, multinational coalitions and be able to uh, highlight some of the challenges uh, as we look at contemporary operations, but of course also uh, future operations. So with this, I suggest to uh, get started. Um, as you just heard, please uh, uh, submit your questions, submit your comments if you have any. We will have time to go over some of these issues and panelists will be able uh, also to, uh, to answer your questions. So with this, I suggest to start and uh, to go ahead with uh, Group Captain uh, Andrew Chastikin. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Um, I've come from the UK's Air and Space Warfare Centre and I thought I'd uh, try and answer this question by looking at the UK's conceptual basis. Uh, you had uh, Angus Lapsley this morning talk about our integrated review. You had Air Commodore Bo Burke talk, talk about the uh, integrated operating concept and then he touched on the, uh, the air operating concept. That's how we think UK air power will work out to about 2030. There are five big ideas or themes which I will talk about uh, this afternoon, uh, but I'm uh, happy to expand on any of those when we get into questions as well. The first theme is uh, that the UK Air will always be operating but ready to fight. The big uh, idea behind that one is it's what does our routine business look like, but how rapidly could we switch to, uh, to moving into a fight? We think that the... Uh, the context is changing in terms of uh, competition and that access to the air domain will be challenged. Control of the air remains the key to enabling the joint force, uh, but it will be more impermanent and increasingly contested at multiple levels. Now, to be able to switch from routine operations to uh, combat quickly requires a high degree of flexibility, and this flexibility is, if, is underpinned by effective training and exercising with partners. 
There is also a link here for the requirement for adaptable C2. So when aircraft are away on, on operations or an exercise, how do they rapidly reconfigure to a fighting configuration uh, and how will they be commanded and controlled? Uh, that work is in train and uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more at table five uh, and I look forward to that tomorrow. Um, the second theme is prep to integrate. This is both vertically but also horizontally. The idea of it is integrated not only across government, but also with allies. It's not just multi-domain, it's making sure that we're integrated with partners as well. In space, later. Thank you. Thank you for this great introduction to uh, get us started. I think uh, you really touched on some of the central issues uh, that uh, we'll be uh, looking at later also, in particular, for instance, on, on resilience, uh, the whole question of, of preparing for that and how to, uh, how to make sure that we have the right standards uh, to, uh, to prepare to deal with uh, an uncertain future. And, and also, of course, as you mentioned, uh, sort of the, the, the contested air domain and how to uh, create uh, uh, different um, scenarios that will uh, put the uh, enemy, our opponent, off guard. So I think that's a, a very, very good start. So thank you for this. Um, I suggest to move on and we'll go to a different country. We'll turn now to Denmark. And uh, I uh, trust that we have with us uh, Colonel Peter Belgaard uh, from Denmark, from the Danish uh, uh, armed forces. As I said before, uh, Colonel Melgaard is looking at the development of the Danish Air Force, preparing for the future uh, Air Force, and uh, will be uh, taking a perspective from a smaller Air Force, but an Air Force, of course, which has also been uh, quite active in uh, international operations and has gained uh, tremendous insights and experience from that. So with that, if you're with us, uh, Colonel Melgaard, uh, please join us. Sir, it looks like we are experiencing uh, technical issues with the liaison, mm -hmm. liaison with Denmark. So may I uh, advise to uh, move on to the next speakers while the technicians are trying to get back in back online. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, this is a challenge, of course, but it's something that we have learned to live with and we have also become all quite adaptive uh, in this uh, last year. So uh, we'll go to the next speaker instead and then we'll see if we can uh, reconnect uh, with Colonel uh, Melgaard uh, from the Danish uh, Air Force. Uh, we'll go instead to uh, France and we have uh, Avia Merlin. Uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, uh, Rear Admiral uh, with uh, uh, carrier experience and uh, it's uh, a different perspective that we will get now. Um, and, uh, and then uh, experiences also from, from international operations uh, and to see how uh, France is uh, thinking about the future uh, of its uh, Air Force and, and the question, as we mentioned in the introduction of interoperability. So with that, uh, Rear Admiral, please uh, join us. Thank you, Fleming. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't have any PowerPoint. As you see, I'm a naval aviator, so it would have been blue and blue. Uh, so I try to avoid that. Um, thank you for inviting me to share my experience regarding plug and fight expeditionary mindset. Um, I look at the past because I think we have a lot to learn from the past. Um, we started developing that concept with the US Navy when I was uh, the head of strategy in uh, the French Navy. So you can Im imagine uh, that I strongly believe in that, in that uh, plug and fight concept. Uh, this is a concept that should not focus only on interoperability, I think. Um, I see two other main factors uh, to plug and fight. Uh, credibility uh, and complementarity. Uh, I will try to illustrate that uh, using my own experience uh, uh, a few years ago. 
Um, so let's talk about uh, credibility first. Uh, there are a few requirements to, to plug and fight. Uh, certain tools that uh, you need to have if you want to have your voice uh, in a coalition, and the coalition is the world in, in which we are living most of the time. Um, this is what I call the entry ticket. Uh, I have a couple of these requirements in mind. Uh, certain objects uh, are making the difference. Multi-role fighters, uh, airborne early warning, tankers, of course, uh, electronic warfare. Uh, but also uh, cruise missiles, aircraft carriers, attack helicopters, satellites. Uh, just just a, a small angle, but uh, when we arrived in 2001 with the aircraft carriers uh, in um, south of uh, Pakistan, um, so it was a challenge, it was a new theater, uh, it was long range, it was six, seven hours flight, we're, we're not used to that. And uh, it was supposed to require a few days before we, we, we plug uh, to, uh, to the theater with the US. Uh, we were lucky, we had the E2, the Hawkeye at the time. Uh, it was uh, just placed as a, as a shadow of, um, of the uh, US E2s from the, the, Calvin, from the, the Stennis and the, and the uh, Lincoln. Uh, but a couple of times, uh, the uh, US uh, E2s went blind, and so uh, we were very, uh, uh, very happy to take, uh, to take over. And uh, just after a couple of days, then we were able to, to, to work uh, I think this is, this is one of the, the, uh, the, the first idea uh, I, li I like to stress. We talked about C2, of course. C2 is permanent. Uh, it does include Intel. And, uh, you need to be able to bring your own assessment also with the C2s on, um, of what's going on, understand the battlefield, and have your own view on what's happening. And that's where you buy, you base your caveats. Um, and that C2 should be flexible. Uh, Going back to, to, to Libya, uh, first it was, it was national tasking, then a few days later it was a coalition ad hoc with the UK and the US, and then it was a unified protector, and then you have to switch like that, but still do the same mission and be ready to, uh, to adapt to uh, new partners, new, uh, new taskings, new, uh, new messages. Uh, so that's, that's credibility. And the, the second point uh, will be complementarity, meaning learn how to use and combine the best available tools. Uh, we, we won't get the same systems, but at least if we have the same uh, willing, uh, then being complementary and know how to use your partners is, uh, I think, one key uh, thing. You win the battle not only with numbers, not only with, with technology, but also with persistence and initiative. NATO is bringing uh, persistence for experience, but uh, not really initiative, not all the time. And uh, this is where I see the expeditionary mindset. And this is, uh, in my mind, uh, where uh, EI2 is bringing value to the debate. Uh, all assets are, are useful in projecting air power, uh, but they have to be employed in a coherent way, uh, which means using every tool for what it's, it has been designed for and combine these tools to gain versatility. Um, uh, coming back to, to Afghanistan, uh, so we were operating with, uh, with the, uh, the US aircraft carriers from the beginning. At the time, the Air Force was negotiating uh, bases on the ground, uh, Manas, Dushanbe, and we were both operating from very far. And so it was really complementary. Uh, and at some point, uh, where Kandar was open, then it was possible to be on site. And instead of having two hours to get to the area, it was reduced to uh, 15 to 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and then the uh, carriers became secondary assets, the main assets were on the ground. Uh, an exam another example uh, was, uh, was Libya. Uh, I remember talking to the, uh, the colonel uh, head of the Marine Corps at the time, and he was saying, okay, uh, we, we had trouble to understand what was going on. Uh, I watched the, the president on TV and he said it was just off of Benghazi, so he said we went to work there. Um, when did he decide to work is uh, between two and five in the morning because there was a gap and nobody was operating there. And so it was filling a gap and it was very efficient. We, um, so it is, it is filling these gaps, having that in mind that I think is uh, bringing performance. Uh, that's what I mean by complementarity. Uh, projecting our power requires another mindset, that's flexibility. Uh, remember the unified protector. Uh, forces on the ground were adapting to the ROEs. Uh, they are understood very well. They were like in the mind of the, uh, the legats, uh, understanding the, the collateral damage estimate. But then we brought the army attack helicopters. And, uh, it was a game changer. It's a, a real game changer with the UK. Um, the lesson is that you must integrate all the assets you have, uh, attack helicopters, cruise missiles. 
Another key point is sharing the effort. Obviously, it is particularly uh, relevant when we speak about air to air refueling on uh, airborne early warning. Last thing about complementarity work your best organization to reduce the loop. It gets back to complementarity what you have. Just a simple example in Afghanistan, we had, uh, of course, we were operating south of Pakistan, so it was. Uh, it was very far, seven, uh, 700 miles away from the, uh, the area where we were tasked. And then we had the army come uh, with, uh, with uh, communication staff, and so uh, suddenly we, had, we could send text messages from south of Pakistan uh, to, to the planes that were operating north of Kabul. And uh, that was a real game changer that we uh, brought to Libya and saying, okay, at the time, uh, HF was the main tool with sometimes 10, 15 minutes freezing. Uh, and then we realized that using the same tool that we had in Afghanistan, we could bring the Link 16 to everyone. And bringing the Link 16 was bringing the light uh, to the operations. So, uh, flexibility, uh, complementarity. It gets to my final point. Of course, interoperability uh, is, is very important. But my message on interoperability is that uh, sharing is paramount. Uh, it starts with basic connectivity, sharing uh, phone numbers, main, uh, mails, uh, files up to the secret level, uh, sharing intel, of course. Thinking expeditionary comes off very important, we all know that. Uh, with the extended ranges of today's combat, uh, SATCOMs have become very sensitive. Uh, but the access to space must, might be denied. Uh, we need to be more resilient. And be flexible to find alternative solutions, sometimes locally. Logistics is another issue. We must be able to operate from any forward deployed base, which means planning, operations, weapons, maintenance. To achieve that, standardiz standardization is really helping. Training, targeting, armament, CDEs must be shared and compatible. NATO is definitely allowing that, uh, standardization. But interoperability is also gained through clubs, user communities uh, by type like MLTT, Rafale, Ripper, uh, Typhoon, uh, all by domain. So let me conclude with two takeaways. Strategic autonomy uh, is not in opposition to plug and fight. Being able to operate independently is a plus, not a minus. As long as you bring credible tools and that they are compatible. When we fight together, we learn how to make the best of what we have. This is real life. The other point is that it has become more important than ever to share data. Data is the new gold. Um, if there is one field where we should work on interoperability is connectivity. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this, Rear Admiral, and thank you in particular from my perspective for highlighting the importance of, uh, of data sharing and uh, the connectivity that you mentioned here at the end. And I guess very often we, we sort of assume, we know that there are challenges, of course, associated with the expeditionary mindset and with the broad coalitions that we see. And one of them may seem quite trivial, but it is, of course, the exchange, the, the sharing of data that is fundamental to uh, so much of this. So thank you uh, for this. And it points, of course, also uh, to uh, part of the future that I sort of suggested in my brief introduction, which is uh, new technology, uh, uh, information and communications technology that may be also be used to collect data, but I guess uh, increasingly also uh, as platforms for data sharing. So thank you for, uh, for pointing this out. Let's uh, turn then to uh, our third speaker. I was going to say our final speaker, but we may still be joined perhaps by uh, Colonel Melgaard. But I see uh, uh, Brigadier General Patotsky on, uh, on the screen. Uh, so I uh, remain confident that uh, he is with us and that he will uh, be able to uh, deliver uh, his address, which of course is uh, from a German perspective. And now the Rear Admiral talked about experiences from Libya, but also from Afghanistan. and. Uh, the Brigadier General may also perhaps uh, bring us experiences from that important theatre in Afghanistan where he has also served. So uh, with that, uh, Brigadier uh, General Kotowski, please. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of this distinguished panel. 
and to elaborate on the Palakkan fight expeditionary mindset. And I'd like to thank the Riyad Miri. He had some very good uh, buzzwords for me. And he uh, uh, talked about the line I'm thinking. And I want to start with, with, with some real basics, I think. It's, it's very important if we talk about standardization and interoperability. Uh, I think we as Europeans, we share common values and interests and have a common responsibility when it comes to preserving freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. And for Germany, as you all might know, the use of military force is, is a, the very last resort. However, if needed, the necessary power projection has to be fast and sharp, and normally will take place within a multinational framework. This is of uh, high value for any appliance of military force, whether it's in context with Article 5 or when it comes to missions outside NATO territory. As military men, we need to be ready when called upon, and especially as airmen, this readiness, I think, is even more important since Air Force capabilities are usually the first needed in crisis and conflict, despite cyber, maybe today. And the ability to fight within a multinational approach requires proper preparation. That means we need to work hard on interoperability, on a multinational basis to be able to plug in, to cooperate, and to integrate our force. That is why our common understanding regarding the Eurofighter Typhoon jet cooperation leads to the idea of um, plug and fight, as we try to work it the last couple of months. But let me first share some thoughts about standardization and interoperability, because I think this is the key to, to plug and fight and the, and the foundation. I think on interoperability between alliance members is crucial, and uh, standardization within NATO has been a success story about decades. Although the operating environment has changed dramatically from the Cold War era, and despite continuing changes today, I think NATO's common goal remains unchanged, interoperability. We find as the ability to act together coherently, effectively, and efficiently to achieve allied tactical, operational, and strategic objectives. And this is still very valid. And standardization is one way, but I think the most important to attain the required level of interoperability. It is a process whereby doctrine, as well as tactics, techniques, and procedures are developed in harmony. It enables the nations to operate effectively together while optimizing the use of resources in the operations, material, and also in the administrative fields. And besides the strategic level interoperability, which will actually serve as an enabler for coalition building, we need to look at the tactical level interoperability. And at this level, the focus lies on the interchangeability of force elements and units, as well as the ability of forces of different nations and services to train, exercise, and operate effectively together. The favorite way is, for sure, interoperability by design, which means agree to a common protocol, come up with a common document, with common standards. And key factors for interoperability are common understanding, standardization of digital data links and formats, as well as joint and combined training and exercises. <clears throat> and uh, this brings me back to our highly sophisticated weapon systems such as Eurofighter and Typhoon. And harmonization and standardization is an opportunity, is an opportunity to further enhance the efficiency in operating this commonly used platforms. The respective user nations of these capable weapon systems could benefit from more interoperability, especially on the support side, meaning maintenance in the logistic arena. And therefore, the Luftwaffe, together with the Royal Air Force, decided to enhance the platform-based interoperability. So if you have a chance to give the next slide, please. Um, we think that um, interoperable forces are the backbone of a light air power. And if accompanied by the political will to employ forces, lead to the credible deterrence we need. The question was, therefore, how to enhance the interoperability with our allies. The Royal Air Force and the Luftwaffe started a top-down initiative with a bottom-up stepped approach in realization. 
In 2018, our air chiefs <coughs> agreed upon the Eurofighter Interoperability Enhancement Program, leading to the Lighthouse Project Combined Air Policy, which followed the idea to implement a plug and fight capability to be demonstrated in securing NATO's airspace at its eastern flank. So, NATO air policing provides a challenging real life scenario with live weapons within the NATO frame that triggers standardization. For example, with regard to the C2 structure. After a first step in 2019, last year's proof of concept reached a new level by implementing small contingents of the Baltic air policing detachment to the other nation and by applying a common technical handbook allowing the technicians to work on each other's aircraft. Next week, we are about to take step three, the integration of Eurofighters and the Royal Air Force Detachment Enhanced Air Policing South in Romania. We are looking forward to this next step as British Typhoons and German Eurofighter will stay on QIA India together and even scramble in a mixed formation. The last step will be maximum integration by conducting mixed combined air policing in 2022 and 2023. And even though I was just elaborating now on combined air policing, the benefits will lead way further. Air policing lays the foundation to further increase the quality and quantity for our common exercises by reducing the logistical and technical footprint, and therefore allowing the participation in each other's exercise with minimum effort. Common training and exercise <clears throat> obviously prepare for common operations. Improving the interoperability will not only reduce the footprint, but allow the integration of additional fighters in minimum time. That means we do have the chance to use each other's MOVs and DOBs, allowing to contribute to military actions right after political decisions have been made. For the Luftwaffe, the enhancement of the plug and fight capability of the Eurofighter directly strengthens NATO's center of gravity, the cohesion of the alliance. And with that being said, it becomes clear that the Luftwaffe is eager to expand this program and start similar activities based on the current experiences with our friends from Italy and Spain. Some of the lessons learned have to be transferred to the FCAS project. It has to be strived for the maximum interoperability possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, General, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, highlighting also important issues now at the very end. Again, you spoke about uh, the transfer of knowledge, and this is not something that we have really uh, touched upon, but of course, learning organizations uh, is also very important, and how do we uh, how do we maximize that, and how do we ensure that we have uh, a solid transfer, successful transfer of of, uh, of the experiences gained uh, in different domains and different operations, and bring this on uh, to others. So thank you for pointing this out. As um, uh, the general was speaking, I uh, received news that uh, Colonel Nelgar will not be joining us. Uh, so um, I suggest that we go to, uh, to the questions, uh, question and answer session uh, for anyone in the audience or online who have questions or comments to our three speakers. Uh, please, uh, now is the time. So I welcome your questions or your comments, uh, if you have any. Okay, Dr. Hansen, we will have a little help from uh, the next speaker. Uh, Olivier Schmidt, he will uh, relay the questions from the audience. Please, That's great, please. thank you. Hi, Fleming. Uh, Hello everyone. Um, I actually have this iPad here with the questions, which I guess uh, put me at, a, at a, an advantage <laughs> compared with being in Copenhagen. Um, so there is actually a few questions uh, for for our speakers about the kind of training that will be able to bring forward this um, plug and fight mindset. So one of the uh, members of the audience is asking what kind of joint training should be established and should we differentiate training based on the type of crisis that we want to uh, that we want to address? Another is asking the question of whether 
those kind of joint trainings will be able to create a collective operational culture. And all this leads to how do we establish a common mindset through uh, joint training. So I don't know which of you would like to address it first. Maybe uh, you, sir, because I'm looking at you. <laughs> so I think with the training, you have, to, uh, you have to baseline where you are today and where you want to be. Uh, so if I was thinking about uh, training UK force elements for near peers, we would go around all of the squadrons and ask what standard they think they're at today because if you look at the uh, the, the standard air activity plan, uh, some of them will be coming back from Opsheda, some of them will be doing air policing in, in Romania, some of them will be in the Falklands, some will be on QRA, some of them will be just about taking some leave because they've been supporting Op Fortis. Um, so we need to understand where those crews are and what training they will need to raise them up to the standard to fight a near peer. Uh, and, and this comes back to who your potential adversaries are and then looking at the, the tactics, techniques and procedures that they might use against you and making sure that you fight at least to that standard, if not higher, because uh, that way when you actually have to employ the capabilities, then you're there. In terms of the type of training we're doing at the moment, uh, large-scale collective training, we're, we're getting back into synthetic training uh, in terms of collective synthetic training in the UK and that's a project Gladiator that I'm uh, responsible for uh, and in the future more of our training will be done in synthetic environment rather than the live environment because certainly with, with capabilities like the F-35, how much do you want to show people before night one and the real fight comes? But the other aspect you need to think about is how do you, how do you generate multi-domain training uh, in Europe, because uh, what can you show? What where, where is safe to do this training in you know in front of our potential adversaries? Because they could collect as much from us as uh, we get in terms of benefit. Thank you, sir. Amiral. Uh, yes, it, it gets back to uh, to train as you fight, and uh, maybe you're ready to plug afterwards. Um, so the the, the the training is is a key uh, is a key importance. Um, what, what is very hard is um, with our forces being uh, deployed uh, uh, almost almost everywhere right now, uh, it is hard to maintain a full spectrum of training. Uh, but it is paramount to, to maintain that, uh, make sure that um, all fields of, uh, of possible engagements are, are addressed. Um, we, 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 for example, we kept maintaining the uh, training at sea for combat at sea. Ten years ago, it didn't seem to be very relevant. Uh, we're not supposed to have uh, naval battles. Uh, today, maybe, maybe it's different. So, uh, so this is a sub affair that you need to uh, to maintain. Uh, that's what you do nationally. But then we talk being together. Uh, being together, um, we all have uh, our normal um, uh, outlooks. Uh, depend on when we are, when you are in Poland, when you are. Uh, in Italy when you are so of course uh, your focus is, is a little bit different but then you bring something that is very useful to the other ones it is your knowledge of the area your knowledge of uh, a certain type of environment and a certain type of partners and so uh, the idea uh, the, the way the way I see it and the way the way we, we do it in the Navy is uh, come as you are of course it requires fundamentals uh, basics um, so you can start from scratch but it's not a problem if you don't have the same uh, exact level in air defense. It's uh, not the problem if you don't have exactly the same level. We had uh, a couple of uh, uh, countries coming with us in some coalitions that were not uh, at that, that level uh, at the beginning, but we brought them to, to that level. Uh, so we get back to pragmatism. Uh, come as you are, but then you must be open to, uh, to, to, to train hard. And uh, so that, that, that's my takeaway. Thank you, Admiral. Herr General, would you like to comment on this uh, training issue and maybe multinational training? Yes, please. And I think we have to, uh, um, to look at different levels. So one very important one is the, is the basic training where we can do a lot uh, uh, to, to set the mindset. Uh, we have this um, uh, pilot training, for example, U European tr training in uh, Shepard Air Force Base in Texas where we uh, train together, where we all have the same mindset, we have the same understanding of how we go to fly. Then we need the advanced training. Um, 
we go to technical leadership where we learn to employ bigger formations, Comeos, with the same group of people, we have the same understanding. Next step would be um, command and control training where we have to train our headquarters, Air Force headquarters, JFAC headquarters, and um, then we have to think joint, train with the Navy, train with the Army. We do that one on one in the with the JTEX, for example, uh, with the Navy, life and, and synthetic exercises are really rare. We are losing a lot, especially in Germany, on, on this one. And then we come to the combined exercises um, and trainings. Yes, we, we offer training opportunities in different areas for space, for weather, and some uh, RC2 trainings. Um, and we do the same, uh, we are joining other training so to get a little bit of interoperability, but we always have to see, do the one, one by one, do the interchangeability. I remember decades ago when we had uh, still the, the Cold War, there were some exercises on, on a, a weekly basis like ample gain cross-servicing exercises where you could go with your airplane to any place and you get your fuel and you get maybe ammunition and, and could fly. Um, things like this are, are lost now. That's why we do this initiative with our British friends. So at least it's the same aircraft, the Eurofighter, we should be able to, to work together at the same time of air, type of airplane. And it took us uh, nearly half a year to get a handbook to allow our technicians to work on the other airplane. So that's a lot of, a lot of things to do in, in, in the basic arena. But on the other hand, there's a future. We have to think about multi-domain and, and get into the next next step. So I think talking about plug and fight and um, interoperability, there's a lot of uh, work to do in, in, in all different levels. All right, thank you, sir. Um, there is a follow-up question, which I guess is related to training, but not entirely. One of the members of the audience is saying that interoperability is, is enabling people to work together. Do we really educate aviators to do that? And how can we do this better? And I guess so the question also addresses the issue of education. How do we train our officers? Maybe when they are baby aviators, when they learn how to fly, but also maybe later on in professional military education, when you get into war colleges uh, and so on and so forth. So I will ask each of you this question. There is not only training, but also the education that we provide our officers and how can professional military education foster this plug and fight mindset? Maybe in uh, somehow reverse order, uh, Herr General, if you want to start answering the question. Yeah, training and edu sorry, oops. Yeah, training and education um, is very important, and we we really started to to beef it up in Germany a couple of years ago uh, to educate, beginning at the officer school, yeah, tell the people what what's what's about air warfare, what's what's air C two, what's command and control, what does it mean, fuel. Um, um, next step was uh, here at the Air Operations Center to come up and we built some, some different courses to prepare the people to work in, uh, in, in, in the different headquarters, JFAC headquarters, in the different areas, planning, um, current ops, tell them about the, the cycle, the ATO, what is an ACO, SBS coordination order, all, the, all these things. So training education is very important. And then. Uh, the next step is to make clear to the people you can't fight alone. Even if you're the best fighter pilot of the world, you need somebody to help you and you need a common goal to fight for. So think about uh, uh, the, the joint uh, arena, think about um, combined, think about your neighbors. You never would go and, and fight alone. You have no chance in this arena. Um, so, um, and the, the important thing is to, to create opportunities, training opportunities in the, in the international, multinational uh, sector. So everybody should give a little bit and take a little bit, and, and this will improve the, the interchangeability and interoperability uh, quite, quite a bit, I think. Thank you, Amiral, on this issue of education. 
Yes, ed education is key. Um, um, pro probably the reason why we can land on aircraft carriers and, and conversely is because we train in the US on, uh, and you build uh, from, from the beginning uh, uh, a mindset on where you can cooperate. Uh, I think the key, the key point in, in education and training is uh, keep your mind very open uh, because you have to learn from the others. Um, when, when we switched, we had a single role uh, aircraft. It's, it was not really multi role with the, with the Super Eight on the Crusader at the time. So when we switched to Rafale, we became two multi role aircraft. Uh, we looked at other countries, what, what they were doing. Um, uh, we looked at the Belgians, and we saw that the training that, uh, that they had in, uh, in Belgium was, was quite good. Uh, they, they were good on, uh, in operations, they were good in, in training. Uh, whatever they, they were doing was, was quite good, air to ground, air to air. So, uh, so we based our training on that, and um, of course it, it changed uh, later on, but we have to learn from each other. So how to do that is, uh, is, uh, is uh, fly as much as we can uh, and do exercise together um, in, in various areas. Uh, the, the trainings provided uh, in, uh, by, by the UK, we, we train a lot uh, in, um, with uh, ranges, with uh, forces on the ground, uh, thanks to the, the flexibility of the ranges in, in the UK. And, uh, and we brought the army uh, to, to train uh, for CAS for that. Uh, I think in the Mediterranean we have also uh, nice areas to... So we have to meet, we have to train together and learn from each other. Thank you. Answer? I think the only thing I would add is that balance between education and training. Uh, certainly in the UK, I think we took our eye a little bit off the ball with control of the air and what the uh, contested electromagnetic spectrum means to the way we are going to control the air. So, so there is a requirement for us to really invest in the education because on top of the sort of the sets and reps you get from collective <coughs> training, it's making sure that our uh, crews understand some of the theory behind the practice that they're going to do later. So we've put a bit more education into our program at the moment. Uh, clearly there's always more that can be done, um, but uh, it's finding those collective uh, training events where we have sufficient mass to generate the, uh, the capabilities that we're looking to practice. Thank you. Um, so I will just ask a clarification from the organizers. Do we still have time for questions or should we? Yeah, still time for questions. Let's move on then. Um, so there are two questions dealing with basically intelligence management. And um, the first one is asking, how do you manage the flow of intelligence and communication through a mosaic of plugged assets in the force? And the second question, which is related to uh, intelligence, is how do you create this plug and fight mindset while you know still having limited intelligence sharing among allies and partners? Because we all know that there are a degree of limitation to the kind of intelligence we share. So those two questions, they are related in a sense. How do we manage intelligence internally, but also what kind of intelligence do we share with our partners? And how can we foster um, military effectiveness, uh, operational effectiveness through a, maybe a better management of, uh, of intelligence. Uh, maybe, Amiral, if you want to start this time, uh, trying to reshuffling a bit the order of speaking. Uh, of course, that, that, that's the key question because an understanding what, uh, what the other is, uh, is trying to do is, um, is key in the... In the so, uh, getting back to intelligence, intelligence sharing, uh, First, this is based on bilateral agreements, so um, there are doors, logical doors for, for, uh, for uh, keeping secret. Um, but these doors must be open, and at some times, um, when we get together, it takes some time to open the doors. So that's probably um, a place where we can improve um, and, and share better intelligence. And, and also have uh, our mind open uh, on what intelligence is. Um, you have human intelligence. You have. Uh, there is a tendency to uh, uh, to be focused on uh, on image intelligence, uh, especially with the drones. And uh, and you you have to keep the intelligence in uh, in the cockpit. Also, I think that it's very important to have people thinking uh, of what they are doing and gathering. So human intelligence is is a key. Um, but uh, yes, that that's almost. One. So that's very important. Maybe you, you have a better answer than I have. <laughs> I somehow doubt that. But, uh, 
my reflection on uh, intelligence is about uh, the lessons from history. Uh, and I'm looking at things like the Libya campaign and uh, where do you need the intelligence and why do you need it in that place? Because if you think about the way we've done COIN over the last sort of 10 or 15 years, we've, uh, we've done centralised planning and centralised execution in terms of decisions where the National Approval Authority will look at whether or not we'll strike that particular high value target. Uh, as we go back to uh, a more competitive environment, that decision making may need to be pushed down and we need to make sure that the right level of intelligence is at the place where the decision is being uh, taken. Um, in terms of networks, we've probably never lived in a better time for, for networks. It's just making sure that the data is compatible. Uh, and I think I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of programs that we've got uh, running at the moment to improve that as we go into sort of the next decade. All right. Thank you, sir. Herr General, on this issue of intelligence management and sharing. Yes, thank you. And I think. Uh, Intel sharing and managing is, is very critical in, in coalitions uh, because uh, if you have a big coalition with, with many partners, many allies, you have different um, levels of agreements and, 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 and possibilities to exchange information. And it's very tough if you have different Intel pictures within your um, community and within your coalition you come up with different assessments and how could you come up with a, with a good decision and the right action later on that everybody understands what's going on. So uh, our, ex uh, our experience was uh, that you need to work this before you go to, to operation. You, it's good if you are able in peacetime to come up with uh, good agreements and contracts between the countries and the nations to come up to a nearly close level. If not, you have to find workarounds uh, in, the, in the arena to, to make the intel picture as close as possible for everybody. Okay, thanks. If, if I can add something, um, um, just to concur on what you said, um, I think one word in intelligence is uh, subsidiarity. Uh, we tend to think intelligence as something that just go to the headquarters and, uh, and stays there to uh, to have the uh, the big boss decide. But intelligence is something you need on the, you need directly in your cockpit that you need on the ground to uh, to understand what you're doing and what what is able. Uh, you need that data that is coming from one of your sensors and that go through intelligence and gets back to tell you this is. Uh, this is a threat, or this is not a threat, and, uh, and so intelligence must, must be shared and uh, reach the, 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 the line where it is used. Uh, it's not only to, to make to, uh, to this to decide; it's also to act. All right, thank you. We have time for one last question, and uh, this is a tough one. Um, so the question is basically trying to red team a bit what we have been talking about. So assuming that we can develop and foster and uh, improve on this plug and fight mindset, what would still be a center of gravity from an adversary's perspective of you know, a coalition of still like-minded countries? And the person asking the question is specifically asking, well, we may still have this plug and fight mindset, but we, we also could have diverging preferences about casualties, about collateral damages, about the number, the, the pain we are willing to uh, suffer or we are willing to inflict to the adversary. So even though we could develop those uh, capabilities and better fight together, we could still have political and moral limitations that diverge among our countries. From ad an adversary's perspective, then would that be a center of gravity that could be targeted, for example? Or could there be other centers of gravity that will still be present in a plug and fight co uh, coalition? And I know it's a tough question, but uh, yeah, if, uh, sir, yeah, you go first, bad luck. <laughs> So we really are getting into the conceptual component now, aren't Apparently, we? Apparently, yeah. So, so when I think of uh, the air operating concept and returning to a great power competition, I no longer really think about plug and fight or expeditionary operations. I think about the fight will start at home. You may not be able to deploy off the island from the UK's perspective. You might be fighting from the homeland. Uh, and instantly, as soon as you talk about fighting from your own homeland, 
you know, in, in, if you do center of gravity, gravity analysis, is the population with you? Mm -hmm. um, but, but equally, I, I look at the UK population's reaction to COVID uh, and how people just want to get on with their lives. Uh, so I understand a degree of resilience than it, you know, within our population. But uh, the center of gravity will shift depending on the, the context that we're operating in. So if we're thinking about a great power competition, uh, everyone's probably on the right, right of arc in terms of you know, World War III, but, but there might be sub-threshold activity. It could be uh, what I would call a smash and grab, land grab, like you, you've seen in, um, you, you know, in Ukraine. But we need to understand where we are on that spectrum of competition. But if we're on the right-hand side, uh, for the UK, I think center of gravity will be around the population's will to fight. Thank you, sir. Maybe I'll move on to uh, Ginal. Okay, I would agree. I think um, even if this is a strategic operational uh, question and I'm as an operator, uh, it, it, it's not really my arena, but I think cohesion of the coalition is, is key and center of gravity and, and population, yes. If um, the adversary has a chance to get in there and um, by information warfare or fake news or whatever, or casualties in special areas, he might try to isolate a special nation and, and, and uh, look for any weaknesses and, and try to get the coalition apart. And I think we have to monitor and, and, and watch the, the cohesion. This would be for me the main point. Thank you. Amiral? You probably remember that quote from Marshall Foch, who was saying, uh, I'm less impressed by Napoleon uh, now that I know what a coalition is. And, and so we tend to think, I think it's, it's, uh, it's careful to think that, that uh, our competitors, because they have a vertical system, uh, will uh, have um, uh, more decisive action and they will be uh, able to uh, focus on where uh, it is important. And because now there is some sort of balance of uh, technology, uh, we have reached that point where it's very hard to, main, to keep up with uh, a higher technology. And, and so, um, so then it, it gets back to people. Uh, people in the countries, uh, this is, this is the, the, the center of gravity on which uh, obviously, uh, and I concur with all both of you said, uh, this is where competitors will try to, to push hard. Uh, but on the other side, um, being all together with different ways to see the world, different ways to uh, understand the situation. Uh, if, we're, um, if we know how to share it, if we know how to decide together, I think we have more adaptivity. We can adapt and uh, being able to adapt uh, is probably the key uh, when you balance the, 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 the powers, when you balance the technologies. Uh, having a mindset on where you can get a little bit out of your normal box on where you are because you have the experience of working with other people with on, on various areas so i think it's uh, it's not a lost combat of course it, uh, and, uh, we have advantages uh, that we have to push on uh, on that plug and fight is probably uh, uh, mindset is probably what is pushing us to go a little bit further than what you do on day-to-day -day business Thank you so much to the three of you for great answers. And uh, Fleming, back to you for the final word. Thank you, and thank you to you, Olivia, uh, for, for helping us. Um, as we learn, it's all about adaptability, and uh, it's about learning, and it's about uh, being able to uh, handle challenges that may emerge. And I may say, this is also an example of it. So we are in uh, Paris. Uh, in the physical domain and, and people are gathered. We also online and we are on text messages and we are on social media all at the same time trying to uh, to make this work and overcome some of these challenges. So thank you for your flexibility and thank you for, uh, for helping uh, making this happen. Now, in my very brief introduction, I'll be equally brief here at the end. I spoke about interoperability, of course, is something which is key. And uh, this is so banal in a way, uh, but this is my take on it. When I look at the Expeditionary Air Force, I think about the ability and the need to be able to, uh, to act together. We heard other buzzwords. Uh, we spoke about complementarity. Of course, the fact that we may bring different assets to the table, different assets to the operations and in this way support each other and achieve more than we would have done otherwise. Also spoke about credibility. 
uh, the need not just to deliver assets, but to deliver assets in a way that make uh, make for a, a robust deterrence and make uh, it possible for us to achieve what it is that we set out to achieve, the stated objectives uh, of the operations that we have. And then in the end, a lot of it boils down to the mindset. And this, of course, is uh, super important and super relevant for us to understand the important mindset, the ability, the as we learned from uh, uh, from the general, uh, very much from the very beginning, uh, having the right mindset, and then you simply scale up and you go to the joint operations at the end that you go uh, from there to uh, the multinational operations. So uh, sort of introducing the right mindset at the beginning a mindset of cooperation, a mindset also of adaptation, and a mindset, I guess, also of uh, an understanding of some of the limitations that may uh, uh, be relevant for, for certain uh, countries. Now, we spoke about caveats, political caveats, rules of engagement, but there was also a talk here at the end of, of, uh, of center of gravity. Uh, so certain states may be under certain types of pressure uh, under certain types of restrictions, it's very important that there is an understanding of this also. So mindset, having the proper mindset, uh, learning from experience and taking the right experience and lessons learned and bringing it into the future, I take away as uh, perhaps uh, uh, the most fundamental aspect of the expeditionary air force. So uh, um, adaptability, learning, having the right mindset. Um, with this, I suggest to uh, conclude the panel. We're going on to uh, the final key speaker for today. Uh, and uh, I thank you for uh, your time, for having me online. As I said, my uh, journey to Paris was interrupted. Uh, but it's been great to uh, be able to join you today. And I'd like to uh, thank, of course, uh, also uh, our uh, speakers uh, for uh, being able to join us from uh, for giving uh, their perspectives on this. With this, I will end and I wish you a uh, nice uh, evening and I hope to see you back soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spielberg Hansen. Thank you to all your panelists and thank you, uh, Dr. Olivier Schmidt, for not only having uh, sharing with us insight uh, regarding the topic of plug and fight expeditionary mindset, but also to have perfectly illustrated it uh, through uh, adapting uh, to the conditions we're experiencing uh, today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Admiral, General, Sir, and uh, we'll now uh, uh, revert to our last speakers. So, thank you very much. So, we'll finish uh, the day with a keynote address from Dr. Olivier Schmidt. Dr. Olivier Schmidt is a professor at the Center of War Studies at the University of Southern Denmark and currently director of research and studies at the French Institute of Higher National Defense Study, more uh, known as IHEDN, ESHDN. His work focuses on contemporary warfare, including multinational military operations, military innovations, and transatlantic security. He has won several awards for his academic works and has policy experience at the French MOD and NATO. My intel tells me that he also has some military experience uh, in the French Navy. His recent publication includes Ally, Allies That Count, Junior Partner in Coalition Warfare, French Defense Policy Since the End of the Cold War, and Wartime, temporary, temporary, Temporality and the Decline of Western Military Power. As he is a recognized expert on coordina coordination of tempos in the defense and security realm, it seemed obvious to the team that prepared this event, he was the ideal speaker to wrap up this first day and put the discussions in perspective, getting ready, shaping our mind for tomorrow's discussions. 
So without further ado, let me properly this time uh, welcome Dr. Olivier Schmidt. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Colonel, for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a really great honor for me, for me to give this address in front of such a prestigious audience, which is bringing together experts, meter professionals, industrialists to discuss this ever important topic of speed, pace, and time in war. Um, so I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Uh, congratulating the French Air and Space Force for uh, for this event, which I, uh, I think was uh, at least today uh, really interesting. Let's hope that tomorrow will be even better. Um, so, preparing for uh, for this uh, address, I realized that you know we've been talking about how to reconcile different temporalities in warfare, long-term planning in arms production and short-term capability requirements diverging tempos of operations, um, joint engagements, plug and fight uh, capabilities, and so on and so forth. And then I realized I'm a civilian. Uh, I'm uh, in the Navy Reserve, but I'm not even an airman, so uh, what do I know? And uh, I kind of feel uh, a bit like I'm addressing military professionals, and um, I feel a bit like uh, Richard Burton. You may or may not know Richard Burton, but he was Elizabeth Taylor's fifth husband. And on the wedding night, he's rumored to have declared, I know what I have to do, but how can I make it interesting? I'm also really aware of the fact that I'm the last man standing between you and a private visit of this museum, followed by a cocktail. So the odds are slightly stacked against me right now. Um, anyways, I, I think this invitation right now is actually kind of a trap, but I'll have a word with the organizers about this. Anyways, uh, uh, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts about the importance of time in war and warfare. And what I would like to do will try to be not limited to air forces, but will of course be applicable to, uh, to air forces. But what I've tried to do to try to make it interesting is to take a step back and kind of provide a bird's eye view of the challenges. My main argument is that time is ever present in war. This issue of time is ever present, but we don't really understand it the way we should. We should do more to understand the role of time, and I'm glad that this conference is tackling this issue. So as a first argument, if you want, I would like to mention the relationship with, this, with time and grand strategy. Strategy is the art of creating power, according to Sir Lawrence Friedman. But it is fundamentally about the future. Strategy is about anticipation, and it's about acting in such a way that among all the potential futures, the one you desire is actually realized. So strategy is action in time and space. So strategy is necessarily about time, and it's about a specific understanding of time, which is the trajectory. So what do I mean by a trajectory? So political communities think about their own trajectories because they always imagine what they will look like in the future. And the way we imagine what we will look like in the future guides our actions, as well as the interactions that we have with other political communities. So let me give you a few examples. Western cultures usually tend to think of trajectories according to a classical narrative of rise and fall. Think about you know, the fall of the Roman Empire, right? Historians will tell you that actually it didn't fail, it just transformed itself. But this notion of rise and fall is very deeply anchored in our imaginaries. And it's related to the entire literature with uh, Oswald Spengler and so on about the fall of the West. So in our perception of trajectories, there is a beginning, a rise, an apex, and a fall, and the end. So this is a very li linear understanding of time, which has religious, which has cultural, 
uh, origins, but this is how we understand time. It is very different in other cultures, which have a cyclical understanding of time. Things happen, and they will happen again. And that shapes how those communities see their trajectories. Think about China, for example. China sees itself as the world's first power by 2049. But they consider it as something entirely normal in their own trajectory. They used to be the world's greatest power. The 19th and 20th century, which is called the time of humiliations, were an exception. And China is simply reclaiming its normal place on top of the international hierarchy. So of course you understand that if you perceive yourself as uh, reclaiming something that is your due and which will eventually be brought back to you, it is very different from perceiving yourself as having to go through an inesca inescapable decline. And that leads to very different attitudes and strategies. So those perceptions of trajectories, they are deeply anchored in our cultural understanding. The thing is that those perception of trajectories, they can lead to strategic dilemmas about the short-term and the long-term relationship with potential advice. Basically, their main argument is that the pace of life is significantly faster in Western countries than in other parts of the world. Basically, we are always obsessed with doing things very quickly. And extrapolating from those observations, it is no stretch to imagine that speed, which is the way we understand life, also shapes the way we wage wars. And this has political consequences for the conduct of war. Because since the 19th century, military organizations have explored the operational level of war, which is basically this notion that, you know, if you have a bold military that dashes, uh, it can deliver a very intense but short military effort that a liberal society is willing to tolerate. The problem is that those kind of compromises tend to produce very problematic strategies that um, basically eschew the complex realities on the ground and end up generating the kind of attrition warfare that we were trying to avoid to begin with. So basically, if we try to win wars quickly, the political level will be pleased. The problem is that most of the time, it doesn't work. And yet, this vision of operational excellence permeates much modern Western military thinking. And the emphasis on speed intensified after the end of the Cold War and with the intellectual domination of, you know, the revolution in military affairs, transformations, network-centric network warfare type of par uh, paradigms. Just let me give you a few examples from uh, the, US, uh, the US military. Uh, network-centric warfare was really this idea that information superiority-driven information technology enabled conception of warfare in which we will be able to faster gather, process, distribute and act on information faster than the enemy is the key to victory. And so accelerating in all dimensions of warfare and being faster than the opponent is the key to victory. So uh, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld uh, in 2003 say that speed and the ability to get inside the enemy's decision cycle and strike before he is able to mount a co coherent defense, and intelligence and the ability to act on intelligence rapidly in minutes instead of days and even hours is the key to victory on the battlefield. 1997, General Scales produced a report called Speed and Knowledge, which were supposed to be a kind of blueprint for future force requirements in the US Army. And uh, I've always been really struck by this quote from General Mattis, who commanded the 1st Marine Division in the 2003 Iraq War, who declared, we knew that the center of gravity was speed. Speed equals success. 
So the thing that this emphasis on speed is not limited to the conduct of meteor operation. It also affected the overall force posture and it led to developing a number of uh, capabilities uh, and concepts such as, you know, prompt global strikes. Um, it was supposed to, I quote, provide the nation the ability to rapidly plan and rapidly deliver effect in any place on the globe. There was, there was also this notion of global response force uh, in which the United United States will be able to send ground troops anywhere in the world in less than 24 hours. And those notions of being able to use speed on the battlefield and deploy to the battlefield much faster also led and informed transformation programs uh, in Europe since, since the 90s. The problem is that there has been a disconnect or desynchronization, if you want, between this operational emphasis on speed and a new way to perceive the adversary. And I'm here talking about a shift between um, perceiving the adversary as a risk and not as a threat. And it's not uh, an academic detail in terms of how we perceive the adversary. Because if you handle a threat, a threat you can negotiate with, you can deter, and eventually you can maybe fight in order to achieve a better peace. A risk always has to be managed because there, there is always a risk somewhere. And that's led to this kind of uh, mindset in which military forces were used not to deal with a threat anymore, but to manage a risk. And, that's, and that also leads and paves the way for the kind of forever wars that, uh, that we've, uh, we've been knowing. Think about inter uh, intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, for example, which are very revelatory of this notion that, well, we don't know if there is a threat, but we know there is a risk and we cannot uh, let this risk be unaddressed. The problem is that it leads to a conception of using force, which is policing and forever policing, because everywhere there is a potential risk that will need to be managed. And here that led to a total disconnect between our operational concepts, emphasizing speed, emphasizing quick victories as much as we can, and a perception of the adversaries that was about managing a risk, so always having to manage a risk. I think this is um, something that is evolving uh, at the moment, but I want to emphasize this point because I, be I believe it is important to think hard about the role of time, about the perceptions of time, and how disjointed perception of time can have consequences for our operational practices and ideally, we will also learn about those kind of past mistakes of disjointing our political understanding of risk and our operational concepts. Third idea, again, I believe that this era is coming to an end because of the return of great power competition. And it's something that is looming in the discussions that we had today. Um, we all know the emerging challenges to the Western model of war, right? Uh, advanced HUAD, diffusion of mature pre precision strike regimes, uh, a shift below the threshold of open warfare, which is blurring the distinction between peacetime and wartime, and also a competition in other um, uh, domains such as extra atmo atmospheric space, but also the temptation to use cities um, and the growing importance of cities uh, as battlefields. So what does that mean for our operational tempos? I think this emerging character of warfare signals a change in the pace uh, of war with various consequences for the emphasis on speed. I think here it is quite important to distinguish between the strategic, operational and tactical levels. At the strategic level, Information warfare, operations in the gray zone, um, so below the threshold of open conflict, all aim at paralyzing decision-making in a variety of ways. 
So um, the objective for our potential adversaries is really to slow us down and slow down the decision-making process. Um, so the way they do it is through saturation of information channels, which will complicate intelligence assessments. So making decisions on the basis of imperfect information is not a new challenge, but is something that our political leaders have not been used to over the past 30 years. And think about the confusion that uh, Russia, for example, um, generated when they invaded uh, Crimea. Those attempts to slow down Western warfare also take place at the operational level. Uh, think about HUAD, uh, I just mentioned the HUAD bubbles, so advanced anti-aircraft weapon systems. Um, the rise of mature precision strike regimes also uh, uh, aim at slowing down uh, Western forces. We can also talk about the uh, special operation forces, which for the past 20 years have been really apt at you know, acting really fast on new intelligence in order to eliminate um, uh, potential targets. And actually, with the new battlefield, probably special operation forces will have to come back to, you know, World War II type of operations where they uh, go in hiding for several weeks. So again, slowing down the tempo of, wh uh, of what they do. At the tactical level, things are actually quite different because things, uh, well, you all know that might, might be much faster because of new types of uh, weapons. Um, and I, I will not get into details because I don't have uh, much time on this, but I think it's important to think about the attempts of slowing down Western warfare at the strategic and operational levels and um, an acceleration at the tactical levels. And joining and synchronizing the different tempos of those different, uh, at those different levels will be a, uh, an important challenge. So in conclusion, what to do? Uh, I think the changing character of warfare questions a practice, Western practice, which is based on a combination of speed and risk management. And for Western forces, there are basically two options. One is basically to do more of the same. So trying to stick to what we used to do and trying to accelerate, accelerate, and keep accelerating because you know, this is what, uh, what we have been uh, learning uh, and we know how to operate um, in those conditions. But I think there are two limitations to this. The first one is that um, Again, at the strategic level, you know, uh, being better uh, at tactics and uh, faster tactics, you know, it won't change the fact that our um, uh, information environment will be saturated with false, misleading information, and that political leaders will have difficulties, you know, trying to assess what the exact situation is. And that, that's just the way it is. So the second thing is that we can acceler accelerate as much as we want, but if we have to operate in urban environments or trying to counter HUAD strategies, the very nature of those military challenges impose a change in the operational tempo that we are having. And at the tactical level, our increased speed uh, at which, uh, the increased speed at which Western forces can be threatened will be to some degree mitigated by advancing technologies, but it will allow us to compete with our adversaries. It will not guarantee a dominance over our adversaries. There is basically an asymptotic limit to what technological progress can offer in terms of military advantage, and the return on investment decreases over time. So in conclusion, Offsetting the increasing speed on the battlefield will probably require new operational concepts and force structures that remain to be invented. I'm building on what Colonel Osinga was saying also in his presentation. We need to think hard and harder about the future of warfare. And uh, I have to say, as a Frenchman who's working in a Danish university, 
um, with a British PhD and a German wife. I'm, qu I'm actually quite happy that those forums actually exist because they allow us as allies to uh, think about those issues. I thank you for attention and I think the cocktail is waiting. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt, for putting in uh, simple words uh, hard work you've been working on for the past years. I'm always impressed uh, uh, listening to you. So thank you, and thank you for your flexibility, having helping moderate the last round table and having played with time so that we can quit the live on time. For people online, I wish you a good evening. I um, invite you to join us back tomorrow morning for another uh, great deal of interventions from uh, experts in air power. Uh, we'll start at the same time and we'll uh, pause at noon and we'll end up with uh, Minist Minister Pauli's uh, address. With that, I wish you a good evening and we can quit the live. See you tomorrow. For the techniques, are we offline?